I see that's come up. Oh, what about the other one? That one also has just come up. And now we're just waiting for people to come along so we can begin this class review, this in-depth class review of way too many different classes. <sighs> so, where the Christ is everyone? As the stream has just begun, we're now waiting for people to come along to be able to view this review in all of its depth and glory. According to that, I have one person watching. So I guess I might as well just begin, I suppose, with a good day, lords and ladies of the internet. I am your host, the Parafox Archangel, the English gentleman of the internet, and I welcome you to this Darkest Dungeon Class Review, where we're going to go and take an in-depth look of every single one of these too many classes that are available to me. <sighs> it's going to be a long day, is all I can say. So, I suppose I'd like someone to tell me which one you'd like me to start with. If anyone's there. At all. Anyone? We've got plenty of classes. We've got 68 classes to choose from. I'm only a even allowed, I think, 57 characters? I think it is, so there's a bunch of classes we're missing. So which we need to go and find. Such as this guy. Do you even have any trinkets? Just started? Indeed, Viper Sniper! We have just started this, this class review stream, and I'm waiting for someone to tell me which class you'd like me to start with for the review. Excellent, Viper. That's glorious to hear. You'll be able to be here for the in-depth review of every single class I have installed in this game. Which is too many. So... Which one would you be interested in hearing about first? Hmm? Maybe the Vestal? Maybe the Shieldbreaker? Maybe the Fury? Does it matter? Not really! I'd just, I'd just like a starting point. You don't really care. Okay. Okay. Fair. Then we'll start with the Vestal. Ah, the Vestal of the base game, and it's being part of the ve the Vestal being part of the base game means she is just the primary healer within the base game, as can be seen from the fact she's one of the two healers available in the base game. Starting off with Divine Grace giving 8 to 9 healing, and Divine Comfort being 4 to 5, making her the only healer in the base game with an AoE heal, which makes her a very valuable healer. But we have to start this stream in order, meaning we have to start with the offense rating. The Vestal's offense capability is 7 is seven to 11, which, if I check within my records, means she is below the average for damage, which is to be expected, considering she's just the, the healer. To, to say the least. What do we have for her abilities then? Melee ba Mace Bash. Basic ability. Basic attack. Basic crit. And, av and the same hit chance as the Crusader. Making it pretty standard. You then have Judgment. The attack that she does from the back. A much higher crit mod. But lower damage in exchange. Meaning that instead of 14 to 7 to 14, I believe it would likely be 6 to 12. 12. Which is a bit of a decrease, but it has the utility of a self-heal. 
She then has Dazzling Light, which is a negative 75% damage mod, but with a massive increase to the, the accuracy, meaning it's a lot more likely to hit. But this ability is more for utility than it is for damage. And then her final two abilities for damage is Illumination, providing us, again, more of a utility basis. And then Hand of Light, which is... Again, a bit more of a utility basis, but also kind of required if you want to turn the Vestal into a mele into a damage character because of that self buff of 35% damage. And if we take a look at the Vestal's trinkets, wherever the hell they bloody are, we can see from her Crimson Court trinkets, she's got the potential for being... A damage dealer with that melee damage increase. The... Is that the only trinket she has that is damage increasing? Uh... Yeah, pretty much is. Apart from this Judgment one. But that actually nerfs the damage of Judgment. Which is that one, right? Yeah. So, overall... Given the fact she starts with below average damage... Her damage abilities are kind of not there, but she does have the ability to give herself a bit of extra damage. And her damage is 14, 7 to 14, which isn't low. That isn't low. That's about just below average. That's about the same... I believe that's the exact same number as the Arbalist. Yeah, it's the same number as the Arbalist. So, probably for her offense, I have to give it about a grade C. It has the... She is a healer, not a fighter. Exactly. Exactly. She has the potential to do damage, but it's not her primary design. Next, we talk about tankiness, or defenses. And... For defences, we have to take a look at her statistics. She has bang average HP. But you can use her for that. Exactly. Bang average HP. 40, the average is 43. She has 44. Fair. Fair. Dodge. 20. According to the, the original wiki of the original game, below average. According to my list of characters, average. So... Again, average dodge. What else comes under its tank ability? Well, quite frankly, self-healing does. I consider self-healing more of a defensive capability than an actual healing capability. So, she has a little bit more extra for... because of the self-healing. What about her... resistances? The average resistance for basically every resistance is 90. Which is what she is. 90 stun, 90 blight, 90 move, 100 bleed, putting it a little above average, and 90 debuff. And 70 trap, which is also the average. If anything, oh, oh, 30 but disease as well. She is 100% average in everything defensive. So, again, for her defensive capability, we have to give her a simple, ordinary C. Now, the healing capability. The part where she shines, because it's her primary goal. First, she's a HP healer and not a stress healer. There is a key difference between the two. First, 4 to 5 party heal. If you compare that as the average, she is good. That's a good heal. It's not magnificent, because we do also have characters like you automatically do three with regen. Uh, who else has AoE healing? We have the Humunculus, which we're not even going to touch on their healing until we get to them, because it's so, so bloody powerful. And... Huh. I think there's a distinct... L Technically, the Grove Bearer is a AoE healer, but in a different way. 
So, AO the fact she has an AoE healer, or an AoE heal, already buffs her healing capability. Next, we take a look at her trinkets, and see that her trinkets are also orientated towards healing. Her Crimson Court trinket alone gives 25% healing. That's pretty good. But then we take a look at the Sacred Scroll. 30% healing. Even better. To Tome of he Holy Healing. Another 25%. She has a lot of ways to just amplify her healing. Which, for the, the AoE heal, is pretty good. But it's mostly used for the Divine Grace. For if we take a look at the fact that 35%, meaning an extra third, meaning that 9 becomes 12. Apply an extra 25% on top, that means the total is 58%, meaning that 9 probably becomes about 17 a 17 heal is a really good number. So, because she is just the good healer, and it's pretty consistent in her healing as well, like, you can see there is very little variance in the numbers, meaning you could easily guess how much each heal is going to do. That means, for healing, we have to give her probably a really good grade, because of what she does. We've got to take into effect the consideration the fact they're not an a stress healer but they do have aoe healing so easily i think they earn wrong num letter i think they easily earn themselves an a for their healing now we talk it's the best part about her exactly it's the main part about her now we talk about utility and it's surprising how much utility she actually has first up a stun a good stun single target 140% chance stun. Pretty good stun. But it also increases torchlight, which is a thing you can never forget about. Unless you're, try unless you're a, a person trying to make sure you're always in the dark. Then it's a little bit worse. But, 140% uh, stun is the average. Meaning, it's just a standard stun. Single target, which is still pretty good, but it's there. Next we have Illumination. Which is a de-stealth. And a debuff. And torch increase. I always love de-stealths. Because you can never get enough of them. And if something's stealthed, you really want to kill it fast. Just because it's a little bugger. And you hate the thing because it's stealthed. That, so that adds more utility. She also has the utility of buffing herself for damage. It's technically a buff, so it counts as utility. So, she... she she does have a surprising amount of utility behind her. If you want the utility, you easily have to sacrifice her DPS and damage capability. But you're probably going to be doing that anyway because of the fact she doesn't have the best. So for utility, probably have to give her about a B. Now then, flexibility. Flexibility determines how well they work in other positions. Dazzling, dazzling Light works in position three, 2 to 4. D Divine Grace, 3 and 4. AoE Heal, four, th 2 to 4. Illumination, 1 to 3. Hand of Light, 1 and 2. Judgment, last 2. Bash, first 2. Her flexibility is... a bit there. She doesn't have any capability to move herself, though, using her abilities. Which is a key part of flexibility. The ability to move yourself without losing your turn via a movement. Which she doesn't have. But it's also a capability of being able to still act if you are moved. And frankly, given the fact her AoE ability works in three positions, she does have a bit of that. A lot of her abilities work in three positions. Three of the abilities work in three positions, the other ones work in two positions. I'd say she's a B for that. Honestly, I'd say a C. As I don't think she has the most movement capability. I believe her mo I'm not even going to look at try and take her somewhere right now. I believe her she can only move one space at a time. It might be two. I haven't used her in a while. But I believe it's on you can only move one, one space forward or back with her, which reduces her mobility even more. So, 
for flexibility, I honestly give her, despite the fact she can use in about three different places, she's a C. Where's C? There we go. She's also religious, limiting your options. That is a very fair point. I do forget about that. Flexibility should also come into a consideration of team team composition. For example, because of the fact she is a religious character, she can't work with the Scourge. She can't work... Can she work with the Fury? Yes, yeah, she can work with the Fury. She can't work with... Um... Who else can't they work with? Can they work with the... Nope, can't work with the Revenant. Another problem with her is that when you do not need healing, she doesn't offer a lot. She does, though. If you don't need healing, she can stun. And if, a, if she stuns, that means you need healing even less. She can also de-stealth, which is a key thing. Basically, for her abilities, if I was using a standard setup, probably... It'd probably be about that. So, Illumination to de-stealth, Dazzling Light for a stun, and then the two heals. Because the other three abilities are what she uses for damage. And her damage isn't the worst, but it's not the best either. Can you be with a Vovaloid? Yes, you can. I'm surprised about that, actually. Uh, can you be with a Parafusi? Okay, whatever. But yeah, the fact she's religious does limit options about character composition a little bit as well. So, again, now we have to work out her final grade. For a final... On higher level dungeons, she kind of needs trinkets for stun to be reliable, though. The thing is, 140% stun is the standard. That is a standard stun. It's relatively reliable against most enemies which aren't just innately resistant to stuns. For example, if I look at, I remember the the ghoul, the big ghoul which I hate, which but she takes more stress damage from the transformation. I didn't know that. Is that a unique part about her? I didn't know that, meaning she works even worse in transformation parties, which I suppose makes sense because she is a bloody cleric. And transformation is kind of one of those things. So, honestly, what's so what for what seems to be the average for most of the base character games, I'm gonna probably have to give her a B for standardness. Fair amount of utility, gold, pretty much gold grade healing, because that's her primary focus, and then pretty average in everything else. But the fact she's average in everything else is a good thing. The thing that you, people need to remember is that average doesn't mean bad. It means average. It means standard. It's not a weakness, but it's not a strength. Me, and if you look at those grades right there, it means she innately doesn't really have a, a weakness. Her main weakness would probably be flexibility more than anything. But she doesn't have that much of a weakness. So, for an overall grade, I think a B. I think a B. So, now to... Excuse you. There we go. Now for the overall... Now we need to reset these grades for the next character. She takes more... Right, so if we're going to do this logically, next, let's move on to the person next in the list, the Red Mage. Ah, the Red Mage. 
You are an interesting character. To start with, I should mention the, the primary weakness of the Red Mage is a lack of support. Not in terms of, like, within the game, but a lack of support in their creation, because they're a mod character. The last time they were updated was 2017. So needless to say, she doesn't have Crimson Court trinkets. She doesn't have Farmstead trinkets. Which limits her options to no unique trinkets, but only the standard trinkets. Which is a bit limiting. So, just saying that, let's start on with her offensive capability. Her offensive capability is interesting. And also a bit very lacking. Her average damage, her damage is 8 to, to 11. So, if we take a look at that, and then take a look at the red meat what that means in the average damage, her average damage is 9.5. The average damage across all the classes I have installed, which is surprisingly equal to the average damage of the base game, is 12. Meaning she is pretty damn below the average damage. So what damaging abilities does she have? First, she has her attack, which pushes her back one space. Pretty good, it easily shows she's a backline character, and she knows that. Does standard accuracy, bit of a higher average, higher than average crit mod, which kind of helps a little, but the below average damage really hinders her a bit. For Ira, because she's a Final Fantasy character. 15% damage mod, which means a 50% damage increase, 35% extra damage versus humans, which is also very nice, but only a hundred accuracy. That kind of hinders it a little, especially as this is a max tier ability. To put that into perspective, melee abilities generally have a hundred and five accuracy, whereas ranged abilities are generally more accurate, such as the such as if we take a look at the musketeer having a hundred and fifteen. Ranged abilities are more accurate because of the fact they tend to do less damage. Hers does more damage, and it targets two people, and has a damage mod increase. But the damage hindrance is a little bit off. It's almost as bad as, like, a Thrall or a Leper for hitting. But things I type in aren't registered. In what way? Anyway, the next part, the next ability for her damage is Bane. Bane is a... It resets. Oh, that's weird indeed. Bane is a, an ability she can use while in position 2 and 3 and can attack anyone. Single target. It is a Blight and Bleed together, which is pretty good until you see the percentages. At 120%. Now... It's understandable that it should be a lower percent, technically, because it does both. But when you think about the fact that the at the standard percentage for anything, debuffs, dat blights, bleeds, anything, for a level 5 ability is 140, it kind of, again, hinders her quite badly. Especially as the ability itself has a negative 75 damage buff. And it favours Blight more than it does Bleed as well, for... I'm not sure why. If anything, you'd think it does 5 damage for 3 rounds with both, but instead it doesn't. So it makes her a bit of a better Blight character than a Bleed character, for whatever reason. So, the fact it's only 120% really hinders her quite badly. So, now we move on to the final bit. Her final offensive ability, Exercise, which is more of a utility ability than a offensive ability. Because it's a negative 60% damage mod, a stun, corpse clear, and it's a shuffle. Meaning it forces the enemy to mix about. So we're, I'm actually going to consider that a utility ability more. 
It's a very strong utility ability because it's got three utility effects, very accurate, and is a quite damaging for a utility ability. But it's still just a utility ability. So, for damage. What damage grade do we have to give her? She has below average damage, an ability that gives bonus damage, but is below average accuracy, and then an ability which has a lot of potential be behind Bleed and Blight, but is again below average because of those percentage chances. And in fact, what was the hit chance? The standard for a melee attack. So, unfortunately, for her offensive capability, I think I have to give her an E. And that's me being more... And I wanted to give her a D, but this just... I think I've given D for more... For a D grade for more than that. So... She's not very good at offense, unfortunately. What about defense? Okay. Well, for defense, she has 35, 36 HP. That is technically within the region of average, but it more towards the below average. Because the average is 43, so she is 7 off the average, which is technically on the low side. In fact, what rank does she come in terms of highest HP? Uh, let's see, Red Mage. She is definitely on the lower end of, of the HP scale. But also has the same amount of HP as a Shield Breaker and a Grave Robber. But they're also considered below average. So, below average HP. What about dodge? 32 dodge. That is actually shockingly high. That puts her as having the fifth highest dodge. So, dodge within terms of avoidability, she has a lot. In terms of actually being able to take a hit, not very much. Well, maybe she can make up for it with her resistances. 90% stun, that's standard. 110 blight, that's above, that's pretty above average, that's 20% above average. A lot of debuff resistance, which is quite nice. Below average move, above average bleed. 50% death blow resist. I don't, this is why I believe the character needs an update. Because of 50% death blow resist. Nothing should have... Nothing, unless it is a very particular special character, should have below the standard 67. So, the fact that she only has 57% death blow resist, and is below average health in the first place, I think I have to... Find my... There we go. Let's just move all my things that I need to click on in the right positions. I have to give her... Defensive capability... A D. I was leaning towards an E, but the dodge does make a bit of difference. She doesn't have any defensive ability... She does have a defensive ability, which is haste. Which is plus 10 dodge. So that can aid with that. Okay. What about healing? Her healing is a 7 to 10 single target heal. That's her only healing ability. And it's technically got a higher, higher max than the Vestal. But a lower minimum than the Vestal. Which, and also she doesn't have really the same options as the the Vestal in terms of trinkets. Which it kind of hinders her a little as well. So, for healing, I think I'm going to give it a C. It's a good heal. It's kind of... It's got a little bit of variance to it. 
She is an old character. She is a very old character. She is. But that does kind of have its advantages. And here is how. As we move on to her core factor, utility. She has haste. Plus 10 dodge. That ability affects the entire party and it can be spammed. In other words, each turn plus another 10 dodge. Each and every turn. That alone is a very strong ability. What's the... Let's compare it to the ability like it from the Antiquarian. What? Where's the Antiquarians? It's exactly like the Antiquarians dodge. How long has this been on? We're on the second character. We're on the second character. And we're, revi and we're reviewing the Red Mage. So, the next part of her utility. Null Blight. Who's, who's the first? The Vestal. The Vestal was given gr C, C Offense, C Defense, A, A Healing, B Utility, C, C Flexibility, and B Overall. So now we get to the Red Mage, which has potentially the most broken ability of all, which is Null Blight, which is a plus 25% damage mod with plus 5, 5 speed. It affects a single target, and it lasts the entire battle. And it doesn't have a uses per battle. <coughs> oh, sorry about that. Meaning you can apply it multi on everybody or multiple times on the same person, scaling their damage to all hell and back. That is... That, frankly, is overpowered. That ability is just bonkers. Exactly. Exactly. There's a reason why when we finally go to the end of the Darkest Dungeon, to the very last mission, the Red Mage is coming with me. Now... Her next utility ability. Exercise. It's a stun. 140%. So standard. A shuffle. Which is pretty good for just moving your enemy about the place. And a, and a corpse clear. Which is also just very nice. That is a, good, a very strong ability. Because it does... More average, more damage than the average ability of that sort of type, because it's minus sixty percent instead of like minus seventy-five or ninety percent. It's a stun, a shuffle, corpse clear. It's got three different utility effects in one ability, and it's one hundred and fifteen accuracy, meaning it's pretty accurate. Meaning it's pretty likely to hit. It's not a strong stun because it's not one hundred and fifty, but it's still a good stun. So, for, frankly, utility, an A, an A, definitely. I lean a little towards, honestly, an S for utility. The character is seems to be designed around utility. The, f the dodge, the, the damage buff, the corpse clear, stun, all that. S she has insane amounts of utility, and not only are the abilities just good, the fact they are easily renewable, spammable, just can just be used every turn. If you want a utility character, the Red Mage is a good option if you're prepared to deal with the fact she's pretty nothing else. What about flexibility? Well... Let's look at these abilities. Her prime, her haste, 3 and 4. Heal, 3 and 4. Null Blight, everywhere. Exercise, everywhere. Bane, 2 and four, two and 3. Faraga, 2 and 3. M attack, as it's called, 1 and 2, and it pushes her back. The fact she has an ability to push her back alone means that's an ec that is extra points for flexibility. The fact a lot of, but she doesn't, and the fact that a lot, she's got two of her primarily best abilities, 
that can be used in every position also helps buff that effect. So, flexibility, frankly, I'm leaning towards a B. Any objections about that? It's either a B or a C. I think I might be a bit generous with a B, but flexibility is definitely one of those things that it's a case of... I suppose flexibility is also about what role does she fill. And the fact of the matter is she fills one role, which is utility. So I guess I'll reduce that to C. Okay. So, now then. Overall grade. What is the overall grade? Unfortunately, despite the god tier utility, I have to give her a D. I don't think she's... The fact she lacks any trinkets that are unique to her, the fact a lot of her offense abilities just are weak, the fact she has 50% death blow resist alone is a big hindrance, and a single heal. So, and frankly, I don't like characters which can only perform utility. You need to be able to do things alongside utility if you want to be a really good character. So unfortunately, the Red Mage, I have to give only a D. If they could get updated from 2017, to possibly fix a few of these issues, like set her death blow resist to six to set sixty seven percent alone would earn her a grade C, honestly. Possibly fix the percent the blight and bleed percentage of her of her bane, maybe increase her accuracy of Faraga a little, or at least make it a, or at least make it a hundred and five instead of a hundred. I think she would be. A lot better of a character. But as she is, she's just not. So now to reset all of the grades. Do, 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 do. There we go. Okay. Next. The Shield Breaker. Oh, the glorious little Shield Breaker. Shield Breaker's the first DLC character that came to Darkest Dungeon, and is one of the base characters, meaning there's a lot of things to hold it against. So, first up, Offense. She has basically... What was it? Six out of... Yeah. Basically, six out of seven of her abilities are offense. So, what are those abilities? First, we have Pierce, her standard ability. 110 accuracy. That puts it above a average accuracy for the standard melee character alone. By five. By five. Which, when you've got to think about all these numbers, five makes a big difference. Minus 10% damage mod. That's a bit of a hindrance. But, armor piercing. Armor piercing is an extremely valuable offensive capability. Because, when you think about the fact she has 9 to 8 base damage, which I believe puts her at... What was her average damage? She is 16th out of all the characters... Including all the mod characters, 16th for average damage. And if we take her crit into effect for that, she goes up to 15th for average damage. Because she's got an awful lot of crit. And that's talking about the base crit and not the crit that's included with the ability. So, when you think about the fact, 9 to 18 damage. Minus 10% mod. That would take it down to about... 
8 to 17. No, 8 to 16. Sorry. Because Darkest Dungeon always rounds up. So we take it down to 8 to 16. Which means that's the same damage as... The, base, the same base damage as... Where are you? Where are you? Where are you? You're way further up. Same base damage as the Bounty Hunter. Difference is, the Bounty Hunter doesn't armor pierce. So, if they're against someone which has something like 80% protections, she wins every time. If it's against 40% protections, Shield Breaker still probably wins most of the time in terms of damage between the two. So, that... And then the crit as well? Just amazing. Next ability, Puncture. That is a... Minus 50% damage mod. It's more of a utility ability than offensive ability. So, we'll get to that to uti for utility. Adder's Kiss. Only works in the first position. 110 accuracy. Same crit mod. No damage negative, And it applies a blight. A, str a pretty strong blight with five... With five points of damage instead of four, which I'm at this point I consider to be the average for both blight and da and bleed. So, again, an ability with an awful lot of damage. Impale, AOE, attacks everyone. Deals has a negative sixty percent damage mod, which is a bit fair because it attacks everyone. Minus two percent that crit. Which is, again, it attacks everyone. Blight. It, bl it can blight everyone. Which alone is the ability to blight everyone at all. Which is a very good ability. But the thing you got to remember. Most abilities which attack the f first two characters in the front line. Have a negative 50% damage mod. When she can attack everyone and gets a negative 60%. That easily sees as a major increase. So next ability, utility. Next ability, captivate. The only ability that doesn't move her. Literally, the only ability she has which doesn't move her position. Captivate. 105 accuracy, which is kind of standard. Negative 20% damage mod. Okay, 8% crit, below her average, again a blight to the same degree as the last one, and a 60% mark, damage, bo 60% damage bonus versus marked, meaning that gives her the utility to work alongside characters such as the bounty hunter, the, the arbalist and the musketeer, anyone that can be blight. That can benefit from Mark. So, for offense, I easily have to give the her a good old A. She is invaluable for offense. Easily. So, what about defense? Her health is 36. Below average... Just like we discussed with the Red Mage. Dodge. 28. Offense is like her thing. Yes, it really is. Defense. 38.6 HP. Below average. 28. Dodge. That is above average. That is above average. Because the average is about 20. Because I believe 11 out of the odd characters I have have 20 dodge. With t another 10 having 25. So she is above average. For dodge. Her resistances are pretty standard. She's got a really good resistance versus stun of 110. Because remember, the average the average for all of these resistances, stun, blight, move, bleed, debuff, they're all 90. The average is 90. Basically across the board. So, above a pretty above, above average stun resist. Above, above average move resist. Average debuff, average bleed, below average blight, which when you think about her background also kind of makes sense for the character, but we're not looking at the background of the characters. 
Disease resist is 30, which is again standard. What other defensive abilities does she have? That's not a defensive ability. Uh, you're not a defensive ability, but this one is. It moves her forward and gives her two stacks of block. Now, what is better? De have taking less damage it, with via protection, avoiding damage more, having the chance to avoid damage via dodge, or just completely negating damage versus using block. It is a very good ability because it's two levels of block. That means she, the big bad enemy can just punch her in the face twice and she just ignores it both times. It does have limits per battle with two, so she can get a total of four levels of block, which has its ups and downs, but it's still a really good defensive ability, which she frankly kind of needs because of her HP, because of her HP. So, for defense... I'm just going to give her the standard C. The dodge being mildly above a average, it helps. The HP kind of hinders her. So you probably want to get her and her... You probably want to get her her building quite quickly to give her the extra 10% HP like I've done here. And the Serpent's Way Forward, it's a good ability. And it's a nice buff as well. But, yeah... Okay, next grade. Healing. Where is it? There it is. Doesn't have any. Moving on. Utility. She has, oh, so much utility to go with her as well. She has two abilities for utility. Block is really good if combined with protection because it makes her take zero damage instead of one, to two, one or two, which could break her block. If you take zero damage, does it really deny block? Does it really not take off a stack of block? I didn't know that. She isn't called the shield breaker for nothing. Exactly. She takes her name literally. If they have shields, she ignores them. So, utility. She has two primary utility abilities. First is expose. Expose is... Negative 40% damage mod, which is a bit, which is a bit, but not as much as you might think for other abilities like it. Bypass stealth and de-stealth, which alone is a really good ability. Uh, increase the chance to crit the target, which is just good, because that, while it's not as good, inc crit increases is not as good as just standard take more damage, it's still a pretty good ability. Then, negative 8 speed, meaning that when you attack them, they're less like, they are significantly less likely to hit anything that, you're at, that you hit. Now, normally minus speed isn't something I care about, but when it's something like negative 8, I do. Because most things do not have more than, I think, 12 speed. Which pretty much, when you get negative 8 on that, almost guarantees your party, or at least the majority of your party, will work before, will do their turn before the enemy. So that helps a lot. Next is Puncture. Puncture is one of the best abilities. First, it bypasses guard. That alone is good. Attack the annoying little bone noble, which just got guarded by the, by the shield guy. Next... Break the guard. That little noble is no longer guarded. And then apply. Can't be guarded. Meaning, you're gonna die, little bone noble, you annoying little bastard. Oh, and also, I pull you towards us, so the big melee guy at the front can hit you as well. It's just... That is five effects in a single ability. Frankly, the fact it only has a negative 50% damage mod instead of something like negative 75 uh, as well is just as powerful as well. Both of her utility abilities have about three effects, attack, 
three effects and five effects attached into a single ability. Now, no, and both of those abilities are just really good abilities. You might want only one or one of them equipped instead of both, like I do, but you should probably have at least one of them equipped, depending on where you're going. If you're going to the Weald, probably Expose. If you're going to the Ruins, probably Puncture. And if you go into the Warrens, I don't think you need it. I don't think you really need either. So, what do we give her for utility? Frankly, the fact that both of her abil utility abilities are really good abilities in both of damage and effects, I have to give her an A. I just have to give her an A. Now, what about flexibility? I'd say a solid A bordering on S. It's a solid A. It's definitely a solid A. I don't think it's anywhere close to an S rating, though, because it's not like give your give the ta give the the black swordsman an extra two hundred percent damage kind of bullcrap. Flexibility. Oh, she is flexibility is her thing. You said damage is her thing? No, the fact she can do anything from anywhere is her thing. Pierce moves her forward and can work in the first three positions. Puncture moves her forward and works in every position. What else we got? Expose works in the first three positions and moves her back. Captivate works in position two and three, doesn't do anything. The defensive ability works in the first three, moves her forward. Flexibility is an S, not even going to question. That we can all agree on. The least flexible of her abilities is Adder's Kiss, to which it can only be used in the first position, and Impale, which again can only be used in the first position, both of which knock her back, which gives her... which kind of kind of hinders the, the abilities themselves, because you want to be able to spam them a bit, but the fact she can easily just get herself back into that position without any problem, yeah, she is an S-grade character, no, along... No problem for flexibility. Flexibility... Frankly, if I question flexibility of a character, I would compare it to the Shield Breaker. The Shield Breaker is the s rank flexibility. Undisputed. So, her overall grade. Extremely powerful offense. A lot of utility behind her. She work... She works with every position... But the problem is, with her flexibility, you also need to make sure the party she's with is also a bit flexible. Because she shifts the party around a lot. Which, if anything, could hinder her flexibility to a grade A, but I'm not even going to touch that. So, I'm going to give her a grade A as a character. Tons of offense. Lots of utility. Flexibility off the charts. Her, bi her biggest weakness, though, is her defense, which is, frankly, average. Kind of, it's, like, mildly more below average, but it's still kind of average. You need to defend her a little. The fact that vanilla units are as powerful as modded units is something I find surprising about a game published by Kel. It's not... It's made by Red Hook. It, it's not... Whatever. I'm pretty sure Kel don't have anything to do with the balance of this game. I believe it's all done by Red Hook. So, yeah. A grade. Because compared to the character mods in Don't Starve Together, which are either OP as hell or way underpowered... Oh, we haven't even got to modded characters yet. We've got one modded character, and frankly, the modded character had the worst grade. So, let us put that into perspective, everyone. There it is, and finally, there it is. Okay, next up. The Fury. God 
damn, I love the Fury. The Fury is one of my favourite characters in this game. And let us get into the explanation as to why. First up, the Fury is a transform character. Technically. They do, they have two different modes, and basically they have tank mode and offense mode. So, let us start with their offense. 5% crit. What's the average, what was the average crit everything had? The average crit was 7.5. So, below average crit. Well, there is one modded hero that shines among the rest. Cough. C don't even start. We're going to get to him. We're going to get to him. So, Fury. Where's the Fury? The Fury is 12th for average damage. Now, let us work out what how that works. Because that is from these stats alone and doesn't come even close to what the Fury actually is. Fury has 14 to 16 damage. Also, by the way, I never even talked about the Shield Breaker's Trinkets. Which have... Which kind of just amplify what she is already. Increased Blight skill chance... Bit of protections. A lot of her trinkets involve... The Shield Breaker's trinkets involve... A bit of defensiveness. Or in this case, extra damage versus marks. Okay, anyway. Fury! God damn the Fury. God bless the Fury, even. So, first we have offense... Uh, defense abilities. So, poison... All of her... His abilities... Have stupidly high accuracy. Okay? His standard attack, Composed Slash, which at this point is what I consider to be his standard attack, has 115 accuracy. That is the accuracy of a ranged character. His next ability, Discipline Thrust, has 120 accuracy. That is more accurate than a ranged character. Then, it's Poised Cleave, which is an AoE ability, which is 110 accuracy. Which is just technically above the average melee accuracy. So, what else do we need to work with? We'll get on to his Fury side in a, in a bit. Now, both of his... All three of his defensive... Uh, his defense mode abilities have a damage negative. Which is kind of to be expected. It is his, da it is his tank form. What are they? The lowest is 30... The highest... The lowest... Highest. The one which does the most damage has a negative 30% damage mod. That is about... What would that be? Negative 5 damage? So it'd be about... It would be about an 8 to 10 damage instead of 14 to 16. Poise com Composed Slash is again probably 8 to 9. Poise Cleave, probably about 6 to 7. Obviously not including protections. Now those damages obviously reduce his damage capability quite a bit. But the fact is that damage is consistent. There's no like, I'm going to do, I'm going to do 7 damage. Then I'm going to do 18 damage. Then I'm going to do 7 damage again. And 9. And 16. And 2. You get it? With the Fury, you can tell, you know how much damage the Fury is going to deal. So, now we move to his Fury mode. Oh, now we get to the Fury mode. First up, Fury mode itself gives him 15% extra damage and 10% extra crit. Okay, how does that work out then? So, that means he goes from 14 to 16 to about 16 to 18. Do these abilities have a damage mod inc included in them? No, they don't. They don't need it, because they have the special quirk of being... F to giving him an extra action. They give him an extra bloody action. The re He's a Darkest Dungeon veteran for a reason, because when he went to the Darkest Dungeon, he just went Fury Mode and went, Slice! I hit the boss. 
The boss isn't dead. Okay. Slice again. The boss is now dead. Oh, we still haven't finished combat. Slice. The mod... The, the other creature is dead. He gets bonus initiative after every attack. That is stupidly good. So, what do these abilities do? Well, they also increase his bleed chance. They give him additional chance to bleed when he's in fury mode. And then his ability here is what actually does the bleed. In addition, every ability in his fury mode bypasses guard and bypasses stealth. Nothing can escape the fury of the fury. The downside to these abilities is they do da self damage to him. So they technically ha they come with a price. Greetings, Casty30. A pleasure to see you. In addition, whenever you use one of these abilities, it debuffs his accuracy by 50. That negative 50 only s lasts one round, though. So if you hit with the negative, if you hit with the negative 50, you don't take a negative 100 on the next attack. You still have a negative 50. So it's relatively easy to just chain attacks with the fury. And, oh god, these abilities have a pretty damn good standard bit accuracy in the first place. 120, 115, 110. Oh dear god, his offensive capability. Let's look at his trinkets. He has this trinket, which exists, and then three sets of trinkets. He has his defensive capab his defense trinkets, which increase his... Increases health, his health, dodge, protection, while lowering his damage and crit. But we're not looking at those. We're looking at his de his offensive capabilities, which increases base damage to what 20, 18 and twenty, and a crit to eight, to nine, and his crit to twenty, and his accuracy to nineteen. It does reduce his maximum HP, but only by ten percent, which is the same as the building, which would put him on standard HP. But it does also lower his dodge to 10. Which means he's not going to be avoiding attacks. Which frankly is what you want. Because he needs to be below 66% health in order to enter damage mode in the first place. Which in this case, 66% would be 30. He needs to be... If, 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 you, if, if you take out the tough mod. That tough trinket. He needs to be below 30 HP to enter his damage mode. What about his Crimson Court set? Well, his Crimson Court set, again, increases his, his damage. His, his damage increases his crit, increases his protection, increases his dodge, increases his health. The Crimson Court set is the average, is basically... It, up, it increases everything. So if you want, so basically it's a case of, I want defense. No, I want offense. No, I want a balanced mix between the two. That's what his trinket sets come down to. So, offense. What is the offense of the Fury? The offense of the Fury, simply because of the fact he gains bonus turns, has to be an S. Any objections? He does have the limitation that he needs to be in his damage form to earn that S. But it is an S. Okay. What about defense? So. Okay. I can't really talk about those abilities yet. Because they're kind of more... Utility. But I will anyway. The, tr the Fury has 45 HP. That's standard HP. That's standard HP. Bonus turns are broken on your team. Exactly. Dodge. 20. Again. Standard dodge. Standard dodge. His but It's also a bit of a lie. Because when he's in order form. A.K.A. defensive mode. He has 30 dodge. Because it gives him an extra 10. And 15 protection. 15 points of protection. So. 30 dodge. 45 HP and 15% protection. Okay. 
Now we move on to his abilities. His offensive ability is also a defensive ability. Because when he uses Compose Slash, he gains a buff for 25% protection. Which lasts... Which lasts long enough that he can stack it twice. So in theory, instead of 15% protec protection, he goes up to 40% protection. And then 65% protections. Yes, it is huge. He also has the ability to mark himself. So that he can say, attack me, I'm the tank. You attacked me, okay I'm mad. Whoosh, I'm gonna kill you now. Slice! And seeing as bonus turns are something only exclusive to bosses, which are usually alone, which helps them fight against four heroes. Yeah. Yeah. So, let's take a look at what his defensive trinket set does. It gives him an extra... What is that? 25% HP. Damn decent. An extra 10 dodge, which would then take it up to 40. Another 20% protections. Which means he would cap out his protections. Because protection maxes out at 40. At 80%. So. Yeah. Yeah. Can reach 80% protections very easily. Has something about like 60 HP when he's tank form. And up. And 40% and 40 dodge, which is higher than the Jester, which is 35. This might just be my own biasness talking at this point. But, oh, and also his, his transform ability. I can't forget his transform ability. When he transforms from his damage mode into his tank form, he heals himself. So... There's even less worry about the damage form because he's just healed himself a bit. So, yeah, for that, for frankly, and resistances. Right, that's a good point, Viper. We must talk about resistances. What are his resistances? Let us look at them. A hundred, a hundred, a hundred, a hundred, a hundred, and forty. His resistances. All of them are 10% higher than the standard, or the average. 90% stun, that's the average. 90% blight, that's the average. 90% move, that's the average. He is 100% in everything. He doesn't excel at any resistance, but he's above average in everything, including disease. So, yes, for defenses, I think S... Is a very capable grade. Let us also note this is the fury after his nerf. This is after nerf fury because they nerfed the fury a while ago because he used to be better. <coughs> okay next stage healing doesn't have any healing. Moving on. Utility. Ah, utility. You'd think it a weakness, but it really, really is not. Let us talk about the Fury's utility. He technically does. He technically does what? So, utility for the Fury. Well, he technically... No. I... He technically does have some heal, but I don't class the healing grade as self-healing. Self-healing comes under defenses. Self-healing comes under defenses. Healing other people comes under healing. And as his heal is a self-heal, it counts towards defenses, not actually healing. If that makes sense to people. So, utility. Okay. First up, should be noted, he doesn't have any buffs. He doesn't have any way to buff his allies. He doesn't need it. He would be too powerful. That's a good way to do it because self-heal doesn't help party members. Exactly. That's why I say that. 
So, first up, technically his transform mode is a buff to himself. So, not really a utility, because we've already covered it in the other two. So, utility. His compost slash, the ability that gives him that gives him his protections, also reduces the protections of the enemy by the same percentage. The idea behind it is you steal percent you steal the protections. So I hit you, I take 25% prote protections off you, and I gain them. It doesn't work like that because you still gain the protections even if they don't lose them, but it's still they lose protections. Discipline, sl discipline sl thrust. Reduce enemy damage by 20%. And also... Reduce their stun resist. Also nice. And also have the chance to knock them back. Three effects in one. Now I haven't come... A note I haven't mentioned the things that increases st stun skill chance. Because they work towards poised cleave. Poised cleave. A knockback which is 120%, which is below average. It is below average. He mocks himself, which is technically utility, and a stun. I don't know if the the buff, uh, if the plus 75% stun skill chance applies before the stun or after the stun. That's the, I still haven't worked that out. Because it's because if, if it's before the stun, it means he can get up to a two hundred and ten percent stun. But if it doesn't, it's a standard one hundred and forty percent. But it still affects the first two rows, so it's an AOE stun for the first two members. Stuns are just good utility, especially if they do, do decent damage alongside it. What about his fury mode? He surely can't have any form of utility in his fury mode, right? Well, this ability causes the enemy to take more damage. It's funny. This ability causes the enemy to take more damage because it's negative and it's taking away their protections. This ability just makes it so that they take more damage by 25%. This ability does additional damage versus bleeding, giving him a bit of... That's just damage. And then this ability is just a bleed, which is again damage. So he's got four abilities which have utility effects built into them alongside what they already do. In addition, his camping abilities, which I haven't covered with anyone else because I'm an idiot. But we'll cover them for the Fury because he's got some really good ones. Such as all companions that aren't religious gain 10% extra crit and 10 accuracy. In addition, he can give negative 20% stress to the entire party adi in addition to taking negative stress off them. That is an expensive ability. It's an expensive ability, so he doesn't get any bonus points for it, but he doesn't lose points for it either. I can see why you like this guy. Yeah, I bet you can. So, for utility... Increase, increase the damage an enemy takes. Increase the an damage an enemy takes. Decrease the, da the damage an enemy deals. And stun. AoE stun. Its utility is easily a grade A. Again, it's probably leaning towards S. But it's not... Actually, because his utility is built into his offensive abilities... And he doesn't lose anything. He basically doesn't lose a turn for just do... Yeah, you know what? I think he deserves an S for utility. I think he deserves an S for utility. Okay. So. Now we talk about flexibility. It's not a weakness. It's not a weakness. It's... Okay. Compared to everything else, it's a weakness. But it's not a weakness. So let's look at his utility. His first ability can be used in position 1 to 3. Pretty good. Then his next two abilities can only be used in position 1 and 2. Fair. He's a frontline character. His fury mode, his first ability, can be used in position 1 and 3. Again... 
It's a bit of flex. It's a bit of flexibility. His next ability, one and two. His final ability can be used in every position and sh pushes him forward two spaces. I can't really classify that as a good as a good upgrade for his flexibility because he does need to be damaged to enter into to be able to get into fury mode to be able to use that ability. But the fact he can still attack from position 3, which most frontliners can't, does make him above average flexibility compared to most people. So, his flexibility, probably a B. He's not, he's a frontline character, so position 1 and 2, but he's not stopped. He's hindered, but he's not stopped if he's pushed back. And I think he can move two, two spaces. I can't remember if he can move two or one. I think it's two. So, overall grade for this, for the Fury. I think, without a doubt, the Fury is a grade S character. He's a character you should always try and have. He's not... He's not completely ridiculous. He can't... Because negative 50 does have its effects. And he can't just spam his, da his fury abilities permanently. Because he does damage himself with each time he does. He's not invulnerable with his defensive abilities. But they do help. His damage is high, but it's not stupid high. It's just consistent. His crit is pretty low, actually. Oh. So, Fury, quite easily, S rank character. One of the best characters I ever have, and I love the Fury too much. Although, although, the thing that makes the Fury overpowered... You can get the, fu the Fury to rank overpowered by using this trinket. If you attach him with the Eye of Immortality, he can't die from Death Blow. Meaning, his self-damage is negated, meaning you can just keep him on zero health, and he's in Fury mode permanently, and can't die. Yeah. But that's kind of one of those out there trinkets. So, moving on, the Scourge, our good old Viper Sniper Piper, the Scourge of our team, and God, I really like the Scourge. The Scourge is a character I do really love. Actually, if I remember rightly, before I talk about the Scourge, what was the Fury's... There it is, Fury. Fury's Chris, Crystal Farmstead Trinket. Plus damage, plus dodge, plus crit, and every time he attacks someone, additional crit. So that kind of makes up for his crit negative. Which he kind of already does from his character sets. The, tr the Fury doesn't need his Farmstead Trinket, because his Trinket sets are just too powerful as it is. Fury! Okay, Scourge! Scourge. Oh, the lovely, lovely Scourge. The Scourge is the Cthulhu Worshipper of the team. He takes the Eldritch Gods, and he worships them, and gives in to them, and, uh, and he calls upon their power. How does he do this? By blighting the entire team. His damage, according to this, is 8 to 11. Which does put him at about 9.5, which makes him below average. But it's a lie. Because he gets his damage from Noxious Rays. Rays which is a... 
surprisingly less accurate ability than I thought it was. Isn't that who we're fighting against? Or at least the cultists and what the hell is in the mansion's undergrounds? Eh! Eh! Who cares? Who cares? It's there. Who cares? So! Anyway. His abilities. First up, Infectious Offering. 115 Accuracy. That is really good for a melee character. Minus 15% damage mod. A bit worse. A bit worse. Then again, our own, our own cultists are worshipping the same thing. Yeah, the occultist. Exactly. So, 5% crit mod. He doesn't crit. He, he doesn't do damage via the, via hitting things. With these abilities. Transfer bl Blight to Enemy. That means if he's blighted, he puts that hit the Blight that's affecting him on his enemy. That is a good defensive ability, but also a good offensive ability too. Next, Noxious Rays. 95 accuracy, meaning it's a below, pretty below average accuracy ability. But it attacks the first two me par members of the party, of the enemy line. It has a good chance to blight them for four points of damage for six rounds. He may not do above dam average for the blight damage, but he is certainly above average for the blight duration. He then also has a chance to, when he hits those two abilities those two in the front line, to also blight the two behind him, behind them, for three points of damage for six rounds, on a 90%. Now, if we take the... the... the Fury, or the Scourge, and give him just this trinket for a start, that increases the bl his blight chance significantly, it takes that a hundred and that ninety-five accuracy and makes it a hundred and five, making it a standard attack. And just it's he can blight the entire enemy team with one ability. With the downside that he blights himself. Guaranteed. Cause it's two hundred percent chance. But that doesn't matter either, because then he just pushes the his the blight that's affecting him onto his enemies. Then we have Excorv Excorirate. I can't say that word properly. Which affects the first two members of the first the first three members, all of them. It He's a blight transfer. He is. He is. It causes Well, the th his let me get into it. It's a hundred accuracy, which is below average, but not too bad. Negative 75% damage mod. Bit of a hindrance. Plus 400% damage if blighted. Which I'm pretty sure means that instead of it... That just means he'll do standard damage. Instead of or possibly a little above standard damage. Rather than the negative 75%. He transfers blight from the... T he transfers blight from the target... Which I think I mean think it means he puts it all on himself. He debuffs all the enemy for negative five speed. Eh. And then he buffs himself for negative forty percent damage. Now that's not a protection. That's that's negative forty percent damage received. That's a thing that can stack with protections. Okay? Next. Abyssal Havoc. 140% accuracy. That's going to hit. It's basically saying, I'm going to hit you. <laughs> mm. 90%, 12% 12% crit mod. Not the highest, but considering his base crit is 4, it's a good chance of, I want to hit you hard. Bypass Garden Stealth. You're not escaping Cthulhu. Plus 250% damage versus Blighted. You gotta remember, 
That is, without him having a damage negative. So that 8 to 11 becomes something like... What would it be? Uh, 30 to 40-ish damage. That's a I want you dead ability. Next we ha and then it also blights himself. But it also stresses the entire team. Your team. So it's one of those abilities which it's really powerful, but it does have the negative of stressing your team. Next we have Unfathomable Torment, which is again 140 accuracy. I'm going to hit you. Negative 90% damage. Okay, this isn't designed to hurt you. Bypass Guard and Stealth. Duh, you're hitting everyone. 500% chance to Blight. Meaning that... I don't care what the double... What the bloody Christ you are. And it disables stress skills. No, that's what he does to himself. Okay. Let me, under, let me explain what it means by de stress skills are disabled. It means it puts the ability on a cooldown, so you can't just spam it every round. You can use Abyssal Havoc or Unfathomable Torment once every about three rounds, I believe it is. He can't de-stress himself. No, no. What it means is these abilities cause stress to the allies and what it what it disables is his ability to cause abilities that cause stress meaning that he won't be able to use unfathomable torment or abyssal havoc it's basically a way of putting the ability on a cooldown without using the cooldown mechanism which i think might have been introduced after this character was created so yeah it's a way of doing putting an ability on a cooldown. So, Unfathomable Torment. Blight all the enemies. 500% chance. I don't care what the hell you are, you're getting blighted. B blight all the heroes. That's the downside. You blight all the heroes after using this ability. So you're gonna blight all the enemy, but you're gonna blight all your friends too. You know, unless you use... The... Unless you use the Crimson Court Trinkets. That reduces the the Blight Chance. What do his Crimson... So what do his Crimson Court Trinkets do? They decrease the Blight duration and amount he receives. So that becomes two damage for three rounds instead. Which is... It's basically a way of helping him tank himself. He has negative 15% damage. We've already established he doesn't do damage from hitting people, unless it's with Abyssal Havoc. Bonus crit. I don't know why. Probably because if you crit with a Blight ability, it actually doubles the duration. So that, that six rounds there will become 12 rounds. Just imagine blighting an enemy for 12 rounds. Decreases his health, which is a bit bad. And increases his stress and increases his speed. It increases his healing received, and decreases his stress received. And then what's the other two back there? Oh, and it also increases the blight duration and the blight. What was it skill ch skill duration skill amount? So he does instead of seven damage, it does nine damage. Okay, moving on. Next ability: purge. It's a heal. It's a heal. I think it's a heal, though, that can only affect himself. I'm pretty sure it's a heal that can only affect himself. So, that comes under defensive capabilities, because it's a self-heal. Fair enough. Next ability, Deathlock. He blights himself, as he seems to do with all of his abilities, and he guards the party. That's right. He guards the entire party. So, anyway, we're talking about his offensive capability. So, for offense, he does a lot of blight damage. An awful lot of blight damage. But not a lot of upfront damage. 
Unless it's Abyssal Havoc. So, leaving Man at Arms in the dust there. Oh god, yeah. No, I don't think there's any other character that can blight the team. So, for damage, I think, honestly, I have to give him a C. You'd think it would be a higher, like an A or something, but no. The thing you got to remember is that over time damage generally does more damage, but it's a matter of making the enemy last that long for the damage to take effect. You know? If an enemy lasts three rounds, then sure, the damage, the full damage is going to take effect. Unless, but the the scourge needs it to last them to last six rounds. And if you're lasting six rounds in combat, something has gone wrong, or you're against a boss. And even then, something could have gone wrong. I might be tempted to up his damage up to a B. Because of Abyssal Havoc. But. There's ups and downs to everything. He d certainly has abilities to. Buff his damage capability. But the thing about the Scourge. You have to remember. Is he's not a damage dealer. He is a tank. The Scourge is not a damage dealer, he is a tank. Say it with me now, everyone. The Scourge does not do damage, he is a tank. How do we how do we prove this? Well, for a start, let's look at his base HP. His base HP is 50. 50 is up there. It's certainly up there. That's above average. Yes, good boy, good people. He is above average in damage. Up uh, HP. His dodge is 20, which is average. He is av- Ah, uh, I'm losing my words. Okay. His do dodge is 20, which is average. But he also doesn't care about dodge. None of his trinkets increase- his dodge. No, okay, one of them increases his dodge. But it's not one you need to care about. Stop to have a drink it once in a while. I don't have one up here. That's the problem. I've run out of Fanta. Matt Pat has Diet Coke. I have Fanta. So, what does he have defensively then? First, he has this trinket alone, which is... 10% death blow resist, 20% max HP, 10 dodge, and 10 dodge. That is a, just a really nice trinket. Then he's got his crimson, then he's got his farmstead trinket, which is fucking stupid. It is bloody stupid. Now, God technically comes under utility. Guarding allies is technically utility. But for this circumstance, I'm going to class it towards his defensive capability. Although it's meant to be self-defense, is not a... Okay, we're not going to class it for yet. But, anyway. First, Exoriate. Minus 20% damage received. Which stacks on top of... Which stacks on top of... Of protection. So, what I mean by that is... So, say, you take... 10 damage, and you've got 10% protections. Okay? That damage is then reduced to 9. Then it goes through the damage received, which is then reduced from 9 to about 6. Or 5. Whichever way Darkest Dungeon wants to do it. So if you have 80% damage res minus damage received, and 80% protections, that means that 10 damage turns into 1. Or the 100 damage turns into 2. Or 4. Something really... Something like that. So, 100 damage turns into 20 damage from protections. That 20 damage then turns into 4 damage from the damage, rece damage reduction received. So that means 
The Viper, the Scourge, has a very rare ability of minus damage received, which is a very strong thing. Then, he also has his self-heal, which also helps with his healing. It, it heals himself, and it cures the Blight on himself. Pretty good. Then he has Deathlock. Deathlock gives him 40% protection. That's just good. That's just a solid 40% damage reduction. It reduces his, his dodge by 30. Meaning that even with this trinket, he's going to have zero dodge. So the Scourge is not avoiding any attacks. He is a wall. He can't avoid attacks. But goddamn, is he not taking any damage. So, yeah. So we ha then have his de his this trinket. Another 25% HP, another 10% death blow resist, which puts him at the cap of 87%, and 15% protections, and plus 50% guard duration with death lock. So, let me explain what that means. Death lock standardly lasts one round. He protects all of his allies for one round. It has its ups, it has its downs, but it's one round. This makes it two rounds. That means that he just death locks his party, his party's defended for the first round, and then on his next round, he can use either Exuriate to make sure he takes even less damage when he's hit because he's guarding his allies, or he can heal himself because he wants to get rid of the blight that's on him, or he's taken too much damage. About half my people are infected with the Crimson Curse. Crimson Curse is one of those things which is an up or a down, depending on who's infected and how you work with it. So, for tanking, or defensive capability, we immediately have to give, frankly, the Scourge an S. And if he's, frankly, he's better at tanking than the Fury. So if anything, him being S kind of degrades the Fury down to an A. He's that good at tanking is the Scourge. Okay. What about healing? Doesn't have any moving on. What about utility? Ah, uh, utility, utility. What utility does he have? He can debuff the enemy for 5 speed. And he guards the entire party. That's it. That's it. That's it. So. For utility. The Scourge probably gets a C. Solely because of the fact... He guards the entire party. He guards the entire party. What about flexibility? What flexibility? The Scourge is a frontline character. Let's look at his abilities. Position 1 and 2. 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 And all of them. He requires to be in the first two positions. He requires to be in the first two positions. That's all there is to say about flexibility. He requires to be in the first two positions. And also, everyone hates him. The Vestal, no. The Crusader, no. The Paladin, no. The Flagellant, no. I don't think the Fury, with the Fury? The Fury will. Isn't it the Enigma? No, the Enigma goes with him. He can't go with religious characters. He's more of a Cthulhu worshipper than the occultist. His, his flexibility, frankly, is probably, because flexibility also includes party composition, an F. Poor guy. No one likes Cthulhu. We're sorry, Viper. We're sorry. So a B then. 
Honestly, honestly, you know what? We'll be generous. We'll give the we'll give the the scourge a B for utility solely because he can guard the entire party. So, what does that make his overall grade? Overall grade, I honestly have to say, he is a B. The Fury, is, the, the Scourge, the Scourge is really good at bosses. He's good at bosses because he can ha he's because he can just tank the entire part fight for the party. But he needs a dedicated healer. B is still a good grade. B is a good grade. B is what I consider an average grade for Darkest Dungeon at this point. Because the majority of things have been grade B. So, Scourge. Really solid character. If you want a tank, you need the Scourge. I lost my best he healer to a rare mini boss. Then was given the ability to re redirect one of my three people. And my best healer was one of them. So obviously I picked Mira the Vestal. What do you mean, redirect what? Do you mean resurrect? Now, where are all these grades? Uh, there we go. And finally... There we go. Okay. Yeah, resurrection. Okay. Next, we move on to the seer. Ah, the seer. The seer was my healer at the beginning of the game. Because goddamn I love the seer. But the seer has a couple of crucial problems. But we'll... But let's start with offensive capability. What's their offensive capability? First up, all of their offensive abilities are armor piercing, bypass guard, and bypass stealth. She's meant to be blind and use hearing, probably. Ah, I got the Seer. I recommend the Seer. The Seer is a really good character. But they're not an offensive character. But let's see why. So, the Asia has 8 to 12 damage, meaning an average of 10. 10 isn't the worst. The average, uh, the average is 10. So it's below average. But... Yeah. She does have this ethereal loop, which helps with her damage for 25%. Arguably one of the best healers. Then again, we have the Lamaya. Okay. The, the Seer is a character that is very... We'll get onto their, heal their healing later. So what's their damages? The damage is a Spectral Blast, 100 accuracy... Which debuffs the enemies, and that's it. There's nothing else special about it. Except the fact it stuns herself. Did you get the reference? I don't think I did get the reference, I, I feel. You guys get all the cool, uh, the p cool people. I have zero idea about, because I have the Switch version of Darkest Dungeon. Oh, that's unfortunate. Can you not... Uh, you might be able to mod. You might be able to download mods for the Switch version. Hypnosis. Hypnosis is minus ten percent damage with standard ranged accuracy. Next, we got Touch of Death. Touch of Death is the only ability in our arsenal which actually does damage, but it's not used as a damage ability. It's used as a self buff. Because the ability has armor piercing, bypass guard, bypass stealth, but bonus damage versus stun, blight, bleed. So if you've got all three of those, that's just a new that's just a one-shot dead ability. Kind of ability. But it's not used for that purpose. So her offensive abilities are just they're there. They don't do anything special apart from this one. And her damage just isn't that high in the first place. 
So, our offense, frankly, is probably an E. Maybe a D, solely because of the potential behind Finger of Death. Or Touch of Death. But only because of that ability. Do you have the original two he heroes you started with? No. I got one of them. I got Izik. Izik is one of the originals. But I don't have the highway. But I don't have Hidden Monster. Which is the Highwayman. Yet. I'm working on it. So. What? So now we go on the defense. The defenses of the the seer. The seer has thirty dodge. That's above average. That's pretty good. They have thirty five HP. That's below average. That's not pretty good. They have sixty disease resistance. I don't know why. They got eighty blight, which is below average. Six. 90 stun, which frankly they need, which is below our, which is the average. 90 move, 80 bleed, and 120 debuff, which is, which is way above the average. So, how what? How? What do you mean how? Or also a thing to remember about the Seer's offensive capability is they can't crit. They can't crit. Ever. So. Yeah. So. Defenses. Uh. The defenses are honestly pretty poor. They get defenses though from their trinkets. Such as this one giving 15% health and 10% protections. That one and that one gives 30% stun resist and 15% and 15% stress reduction, which is needed. This one gives 15% protections, and this one gives 10 HP, but minus 10 dodge, which is kind of bad. But they still give both plus debuff resist and stun resist and minus stress. So, ups and downs. So, frankly, their, their defense... I think is a D again solely because of their solely because of their trinkets. If they're without their trinkets, it's an E for defense. The dodge is there, which the dodge is there, but the defenses aren't. Now, what about they're healing. Oh, dear Christ. They're healing. We love their healing. Hmm. First, they have Celestial, Celestial Renewal, which is a 6 to 8 heal, which is below the Vestal, which is 8 to 9, but is pretty standard amongst the mod characters, actually. 6 to 8 is the standard amongst the mod characters. In addition, 50% of the time, they'll heal an additional 40% 4 HP. And 30% of the time, they heal an additional 6, 6 HP. Meaning the potential, the max potential heal with that ability is a 18. Before you start applying the buffs of such as 20% healing skills. But... The bug people scare me. Which bug people? Now, what else do they have? What the next healing ability is Rejuvenating Surge. Honestly, I consider Rejuvenating Surge better than Celestial Renewal. Ah, the Crimson Court. That's fair. That's very fair. Rejuvenating Surge is better than the Celestial one. Because first, it's AoE. AoE healing is just nice. It's a heal as well, which is just good. And then it has the chance to apply a restoration 
onto your ally, onto your heroes. Now, here's the fun fact about restoration, which I have learnt from my six, from my ninety plus episodes of Darkest Dungeon. Restoration applies before bleed and blight, meaning that if someone is blighted or ble or bleeding, and they've got a restoration on them. They can't die from Death's Door. Because the healing will take effect, meaning they'll go above zero. Then the bleed will take effect, meaning they'll go back to zero. That is why restorations are very, very powerful. And also why they've got the weakness of the fact they can't be amplified. Which is why the, Celest the, the Seer has her Crimson Court set. Which gives... Plus 50% duration to restoration, meaning it lasts three rounds instead of two. And 50% more restoration, meaning it's five HP instead of three. Meaning her restoration goes from six HP in total to 15, which is a major increase to her healing. Plus 40% healing skills to, to, to Celestial Renewal, which means just... It'll go from the potential of 18 to approximately 24-ish. Which just helps the nuke healing. Next. Her next healing ability. Tranquility. Tranquility is a stress heal. That affects the entire party. Crap people, crap people. Stress heal, a AOE stress heal is an extremely good ability because the majority of stress heals are single target. So if you can have someone which stress heals the entire pe the entire party, that's nice, even if it is only for four stress. But it does have the twenty five percent chance of being ten stress instead. Now, when you could take into consideration the fact that a let's look where are you, Jester. The Jester's stress heal is 12. The, the Seer's stress heal is 4 across the entire party. Meaning it's 16 in total. With the potential of becoming 6. Of, or 10 instead. And actually on average means that one, in, one of the 4 members of the party will get stress healed for 10 instead of 4. That is... She is a really good stress healer. She's certainly not the best. By f nowhere near is she the best stress heal healer. But she's still a good one. She's still a good one. So, healing. What is the healing grade of the seer? They have a really big single target heal. They have an AoE heal, which gives them the ability to basically negate... Death from static from oh dots. That's the term. Damage over time. Dots. And a stress heal. You would say an A. I lean towards an S, but we can go with an A. There we go. Because of the fact it's an A, it's just she's got really good stress healing. What about utility? She's got the utility to buff herself for additional stress healed and healing effect for the next heal. Because that effect only lasts the next round. So it's good for one heal. She buffs herself tons for stun resistance. But there's good reason for that. She can then also apply Ethereal Blessing. Which is... A 30% damage reflection to the entire party, which if you've ever seen me fight the farmstead, you'll learn is very, very useful. 30% damage buff to whoever affects, with a plus percent crit buff with whoever affects, and it has a 40% chance to make it 60 and 12 instead of 30 and 6. That is an extremely strong buff. 
That is just an extremely strong buff. Just because it affects the entire party, as well as affecting the single target. But it's also kind of all she has. For her utility. So for utility, could you buff the buff time? No. No, you can't. It lasts two rounds. So, if you buff the... If you buff them with that ability, they'll get two attacks off with the buff effect. Which does mean you could technically buff them again, so that they get the buff effect twice, but they do have the buff effect. It is an extremely strong ability, and they do have the ability to augment themselves. So, B, you say... I suppose a B is fair. Flexibility. They're a backline character. They are only a backline character, and that is all they are. A backline character. They work in position 3 and 4. So that immediately takes negative off their flexibility. But, they have Touch of Death, which, as we've established, is a pretty good ability. Because it also sends them back two spaces. Meaning they will always be at the minimum of position three. Meaning that on the very next ability, they will be on the very next round, they'll be able to do something. A D or a C, I'm assuming. I'm giving it a C because they cut they be wrong one. They can't work in other positions. But they have the ability to quite easily get back to their position. Oh, in a single turn rather than one or two. So, overall grade. Overall grade. Oh, Miss Sia, what am I going to give you for your overall grade? You are very weak. You have a S. I'm guessing you really like the Seer, don't you, Michael? A, B, or a C? I, it's a C or a B. It's a C or a B. They're very... They have no offensive capability. They are... A, they have extremely limited offensive capability, at the very least. They are a dedicated healer. With the ability to both heal, sing, big heal single, relatively big AoE, relatively big stress heal, and the ability to buff an ally so that they can do the damage instead, so that they don't have to when they don't have the when they don't need to heal. So, I, despite the fact they were basically the healer I solely used at the beginning of the game, I gotta give them a B. Yeah, but I forgot I forget to use her. She's she has a time. She is the reason I also give her a B instead of like an A and po possibly a lean more towards a C is because of her stun mechanic. Which is that every time she uses an ability, she can stun herself. The heals are really are real good. The heals are really good, but because of her inbuilt mechanic, she can uh, she can potentially only heal you once every other round. Because when she uses Celestial Renewal, she has a chance to stun herself. When she uses Tranquility, she has a chance to stun herself. When she uses Rejuvenating Surge, she has a chance to stun herself. There's, there's the, always the threat with the Seer that she won't be able to act on the next turn. Her heals are extremely good to try and make up for that. But there's always that inbuilt little threat that she won't be able to do the work on the next turn. So if anything, I think she leans more towards a C than a B. Because of the mild unreliability. It's like a slacking in Pokemon. Yes, actually it is. It's like a slacking in Pokemon.
can only work every other uh, other round potentially. Honestly, I find that if you manage to avoid the first round, avoid the stun the first round, you will not be stunned because of the 50% bu stun resist buff that she applies to herself every time. And they last two rounds, so you'll be able to get up to 100% stun resistance from her abilities. Which, when you combine with this, becomes 200%, meaning she's pretty res she's got a very little chance of stunning herself. Okay. So, Great C, just because there, there's always the threat that she might not just, you know, do anything next turn. Next one in the list is the Crusader. I've done the Crusader. Watch the videos, you lazy bastards. The Paladin. Oh, goody, the Paladin. Okay, Mr. Paladin. I'm so happy to see... I'm so happy you are live streaming again. Don't expect it for long. I'm just on a three-week paid holiday at the moment, thanks to the virus. If you want me to stream more, make me popular so I can actually f f reliably stream every week. I just have to wake up early to catch you. That's the problem with time changes. So, let's talk about the Paladin. What is the Paladin? The Paladin is whatever the goddamn hell you want it to be. It can be a tank. It can be the damage dealer. It can be the healer. It probably can't be the utility guy. It can't be the utility guy. It can mildly be the utility guy. It can't very well be the utility guy. And time zones. You always stream near, near, near midnight in Asia. Yeah... But it's like that for everyone, really. So, okay. Let's talk about the, the Crusader. So, the Crusader... The Crusader's damage is pretty... The Crusader has a combo effect with its damage, okay? So, the way it works is he's got 9 to 18 damage. That is a very good number that puts him at... What rank is it? Paladin, Paladin, Paladin. Uh, 16th. 16th for damage. Or completely drawn with the Shield Breaker for damage. Probably lower in rank in total with the Shield Breaker because he's got less crit. But we'll get to that. So, he has Crusader Strike for his base ability. Standard, da standard Accuracy... 9% crit mod, which I'm at this point thinking is standard. Meaning 15% chance to crit overall. And a good solid hit. That's it. Nothing special about it. Next a bit. Now, it also has the buff to buff Divine Storm for 50% extra damage. Okay. What's Divine Storm? Divine Storm is his AoE ability. Same accuracy of the standard 105. Minus 50% damage mod. Which is standard for when you attack two people. 6% crit mod. So light, less likely to crit. And 35% armor piercing. Which, which is a pretty high number. That'll get through the majority of protections that the game offers. But also, because of the fact you just did Crusader Strike first. It, doesn't, it negates that 50% damage mod. Because you've been buffed for 50% damage. While using the ability. So it's basically. You use that ability. Then you use that ability. You use that ability. Then you use that ability. So it's kind of a combo stacking effect. What about their trinkets? What trinkets do they have? Well. Let's look at the Crusader. Tr their Crimson Court trinkets. For a start. First up. Negative 30% HP. Ouch. What do their trinkets do then? Well, on attack, all heroes buff, all heroes heal for one HP, and buff self for three dodge. Wow. Okay. Twenty percent death blow resist and ten percent damage received. Okay. On attack, buff self for three percent damage and three crit. 
So, using the Crimson Court Trinkets, they become an escalating tirade of destruction. So really good versus bosses. What if you don't want that? Well, there's also Seal of Blood, which is 10%, 15% bonus damage with melee hits, 10% bonus crit chance with melee hits, and 5 accuracy. But every time they hit, they hurt themselves. Ouch. And then their other trinkets are either healer, utility, or utility. Okay. What else do they have offensively? You're not offensive, you're not offensive, you're not offensive, and you're not offensive. And then they got judgment. Judgment is an ability that pulls them forward. So the paladin is a multi-class, jack of all trades, but master of none. Or rather... The jack of all trades, but master of all. <laughs> no. Uh, well, no, not really. So judgment is an ability with same accuracy of 105. Because it's a ranged attack, that's technically below average, but the Crusader is a melee character. Minus 25% damage mod. Fair. Plus 13% crit mod. Okay, so he's a lot more likely to crit with this ability, even if it does less damage. And then pull himself forward too. Meaning, he can use this ability to pull himself back to the front if he gets knocked back for whatever reason. That's good for flexibility. Okay. <coughs> oh, I'm losing my voice. So, offense capability. There goes Tokyo Die Die Godzilla, yeah. So, offense capability. They have quite a lot, but they're kind of standard as well. So, offense, I'm going to give them a B. Good damage. They got, ri they got pretty good damage. There's ways to buff it, but that's kind of it. They just hit. Kind of like a Crusader. They just hit them. Okay, defenses. 25 hit dodge, already good, that's technically the standard. 55 HP, that is abo way above average, and puts them at 11th, for, 11th in total for, ma for highest HP, on par with the, the Mana Arms and the Harbinger. And then, they also have... Their protections. They have 100% stun. Good. 100% blight. Good. 100% move. 100% bleed. And 90% and debuff. Okay, so they don't really have any weakness in resistances. And they're pretty above average in all resistances too. Pretty good. Standard disease of, of 30. So, disease is technically a weakness without even being a weakness. Technically. What about their defensive abilities? Well, technically, Sh Sacred Shield is a defensive ability, as it can give a level a block, but it can also be applied to allies. So I'm kind of considering that utility healing ability. But it's also a bit of a defensive ability. What about their trinkets? Well, uh, they don't have any trink any. None of their standard trinkets give defenses. Their Crimson Court trinkets reduce their max HP. But their Farmstead trinkets... Oh gosh, the Farmstead trinkets. Well, let's see what they do. This one gives 20% extra HP, taking it up to 66. Nice. It also gives 20% protection. Nice. But it reduces their damage by 50%. Oh. So they're not going to be a, the damage dealer if you want them to be the tank. But that's kind of fine, considering a lot of their abilities actually cause them to mark themselves as well. So they're going to be taking a lot of damage anyway. Pa party this casual. Party this casual? That trinket also causes them to guard any ally that they use a friendly ability on. But that's more utility. 
And then this trinket gives 50% damage reflection, but causes them to take 50% more damage. So that's not really defense, but it's also not really... It's more utility than anything. So for defense, they got... Parry this casual. So they got above... They got really good HP... They got a, so a really good trinket available to them. It's a farmstead trinket, but so it's a little harder to get, but yeah. And 25 dodge, which is technically standard, but yeah. So for defense, I'm giving them a B as well. Now, now we move on to healing. Their heal, their single, their heal is a 5 to 6 heal. Which is... That's the Paladin heal, isn't it? Yeah. They have the same healing amount as the Paladin. Five to six. But... They have this trinket. Which gives them... Plus four additional healing. Which means that five to six... Becomes nine to ten. That means that heal already outranks the Vestal. That heal... Already outranks the Vestal of 8 to 9 by 2 points. Or 1 point. Even. But. We're not done. Because if you use Crusader Strike or Judgment. Because they have the same effects. You get an additional plus 3 healing. Which means that 9 to 10 has now become 12 to 13. Yeah. That's a pretty strong heal. How else can we buff it? Well, technically, if you technically, if you truly want to abuse the healing capability of the paladin enough, we can go down into the custom trinkets and see what happens if we apply the last light. Now, the thing about the the paladin is that rather than using plus percentage of healing skills, like most characters, he just uses plus healing receipt, plus healing. So, this gives plus three healing. This gives plus four healing, meaning that's plus seven healing. So, this ability, if it does minimum, means it does 12 healing. Then, if we apply this on top, which is a two heal whenever he does a heal, means that gets a plus six, plus seven, meaning it's nine, meaning he goes from 12 healing to 21 healing. So, by applying this heat, this last light legacy, the last light trinket, he is, we have just basically doubled his healing. Or, or, if you want to turn him into a tank, alongside his healing, you can give him the, the seal of sanctuary. Which means, everybody, he, everybody that he heals, he guards. Meaning that if you just healed an ally who just got hit, crit very, very hard, you guard them, meaning you're now the now you're the tank and you're taking the hits for them. Meaning they're a very good healer tank combo. But that's just their so solid heal. What else do they have? Sacred Shield. What? That's ridiculous. What the what, the last light legacy, or the fact they they can guard their allies that they heal? So. What's the next trinket? Both. Yeah. So what's the next ability? The next ability is Sacred Shield. Sacred Shield is a block, is an ability that applies a block, and then cures Blight and, blight and Bleed. Being able to cure Blight and Bleed is always a really nice ability. Just for healing, utility, whichever way you want to categorize it. I kind of categorize it as healing. It then also buffs the target for plus 30% healing received. Which means you'll be able... So that once that block wears off, you'll be able to heal them. Very nice. Very nice. They then have this ability here. Blessing of Freedom. Which is a free action. Meaning their turn doesn't end after they use it. Which allows them to clear stun. 
which means that if your ally stunned, so let's say, so if, for example, your thrall just head just gored them and stunned himself, it means that the paladin can cure him of that stun so that he will actually be able to act next round. It's good. He's good. He's got a lot of healing and utility behind him. I say that he has the potential to outheal the occultist. Because if he crits with either heal, he'll do probably about 30 healing. If he crits with both, he could do up to about 40. So, for healing, the, the paladin is easily an A. Now, he's not an S simply because he's not an AoE healer. He can only heal a single target. And he can't stress heal either, which is another negative. But for a HP healer, he can outheal the occultist if the occultist can that turn. If the occultist can what that turn. So, he doesn't have AoE healing, and he doesn't have stress healing. He's just a very powerful single target healer. It's why he's only A and not an S. Okay, what about utility? Clear a stun. That could be classed as utility. When he does that, he buffs people for 50 for 200% move resist, that's pretty good. They're not moving according to the enemy. But move resist is one of the weak... Move resist is probably the weakest resistance to buff. Because simply, you can move your... The, your allies can get moved, which can screw you up as well. So, it's one of those, okay, buffs. He can buff a target for plus 30% healing received. So if you've got two healer, so if you've got a healer and an off healer in the group, and the paladin is either, he can really help the other one in, in dire times. And then he's got an AoE stun, which is just a standard 140% stun with a, which targets the first two people, but it doesn't do any damage, which is the downside. Frankly, I really don't like stuns that don't do damage. Because it just feels like, well, if I had just spent that term hitting them, it would just have been just as effective. Because they would die in the same amount of time. Kind of thing. But that's just me. So for utility, I'm gonna give the poor guy a D. Oh, wrong letter. D. Because he has a bit, but it's not the best. What about flexibility? <coughs> mm. Flexibility for the Paladin is actually really, really strong. Funny enough. Feel the backhand of justice. Yeah, pretty much. His... If you want him to be a melee character, he works. he's a frontline character that can only work in the first two positions. That's like standard for most melee characters. If he gets moved, he can use judgment to move him back into the first two positions. Because it moves himself forward. I don't see the downside right there. Okay, what else can he... But what about his healing? His healing is the best part about his flexibility. Because it can be used in any position. The Paladin is a character which I use for when I've created a team and I just need a healer that can be in to fill the position that's left. Because the Paladin can be in any position as a healer. First, second, third, fourth. As you can see right here, he's good in every position as a healer. And if, for the melee, he can just pull himself forward and barely lose any of his damage as well on top. So, frankly, for flexibility, I easily think he's an A. He is like an S, then. 
Honestly, yeah, he's an S. Because he's an S for flexibility. Because he can work in every position. And when he gets out of position for when he's in melee, he can just spend a turn. Which doesn't cost him anything because judgment doesn't really lose any damage. Because it's tw minus 25% instead. But it gets increased crit mod, which can make up for it. To get back into position. So, yeah. S, in d S for flexibility. So, what rank do we give the poor guy overall? I lean towards an A. It's an A or a B for me. What do you all vote for? Sounds like a B or an A. Yep, it's a B or an A. It's like a B plus. An A or a B. Yep. It's a B plus, A minus kind of character. But I haven't given put pluses or minuses, so we're going to go with the... Uh, be nice and go with the upper bracket. And give the Paladin an A! Congratulations, Mr. Paladin, on your lovely little A rank. Right then. So, who is next in our list? Ah, the flagellant. Ah, the flagellant. Oh, what can we say about you? Well, there are many things that can be said about you, Mr. Flagellant. A pseudo tank. Not really. Not really. Okay. Let us start with his damage. His damage is 5 to 11. Which is very, very bad. If we take a look at his average in compared, compared to everyone, it makes him the, th the second worst damage on par with the Martyr... Let's take a look at the Martyr. Puts him on de par with the Martyr and the Librarian. In terms of his base damage. Not including including bleed or whatnot. But when we take bleed into effect, it's six bleed for three rounds. With 115 accuracy. I didn't re okay. I I didn't realise he was that accurate with his attacks. I'll admit, I didn't realise he was that accurate. Wow, that's actually surprising. I thought it'd be 110. <laughs> anyway, he's ba he he's a really damaging via bleed because it's so it's high damage, which is which applies fairly quickly. Six points for three rounds. Flagman, flagman. I'm glad he's not that mad. So that's 18 damage over 3 rounds. That is pretty goddamn high damage. Then we go to his AoE ability, which is the back row. So he gets abil the ability to attack the back row. That's 15 damage over 3 rounds. And then we go to his Exangle Grate, which is 9. Which is 27 o damage over 3 rounds. There are reasons why there are images on the internet of this guy soloing bosses. You know, before his nerf. He became a flagellant because he realized his kink or purpose in life if you take his story into account. Alright. Not gonna cut not gonna comment. His crit is standard. 9% crit mod on the attack, 6%. 6% on the character. The 6% is technically below average because the average is 7.5, but there are but he's not a crit character. He's a dot character. So we're not going to take crit into effect for his damage. So he has these three a bit he only has three abilities for his damage. And then his solid damage, which is fairly low. What about his trinkets? Well, he's got increased bleed chance. 
He's got... Uh... Let's just do that. That's plus 20% damage, which takes it to 6 to 14. That's a pretty solid damage. What else? What else? Uh... That's just... Doesn't apply to his damage, and these don't either. So... What is the damage of the flagellant, then, in this situation? He's got a 140% chance to bleed, which can go up to 175 with his Crimson Court Trinket. That is an awful high chance to bleed. But, he still has the limitation that the enemy has to be able to bleed. Meaning, he's useless versus skeletons. He's useless versus undead. He's useless versus things that just don't want to bleed. So. His damage. Normal damage could be a C. His normal damage is very low. His normal damage is 5 to, se five to 11. That's... Like, D rank for normal damage. His bleed damage is what ups it quite significantly. So, his damage I personally give is a B. Solely due to the limitation that it is only bleed damage. He only gets his damage from bleeding. It's kind of the same problem that the Scourge has. The Scourge gets all of their damage from Blighting. They don't get any from step from hitting things. They get all their damage from Blighting things. And if something just doesn't want to be Blighted, well, it just doesn't want to be Blighted. And the thing is, bl it's easier to Blight enemies than it e is to make them bleed. There are more enemies resistant to bleed than there are those resistant to Blight. That's the thing. Blight is innately more powerful than Bleed. This is the weakness of the Flagellant. He is, a, he is one of my favourite damage dealers because of his potential. But he's not the most damaging if he can't make them bleed. He's just taking up space. So. What about tankiness? What about his tankiness? Well... Let us take a look at his tankiness, shall we? First up, his health is 38. That's below average. He doesn't have high health. His health, his dodge, is 20. That's below average according to the standard game, but average according to my game. So, average in that department. Resistances. He's actually really high for resistances. 40% disease resist, that's above average. 110% stun, that's good. 90% blight, that's average. 110 move, that's really good. 125% bleed resist, that's pretty insane. And 90% debuff resist, which is just standard. Does he have any special abilities to... Buff his res buff himself. <coughs> My God, I talk too much. His Crimson Court trinket gives him twenty percent extra HP. That takes it to about. Let's see. Forty-six. Forty-six is average. So he, if he's got his Crimson Court trinket set equipped, which frankly. He isn't a bad set to equip him with. He has average defensive capability. From stats. But, what about self-healing? This is where he gets good. His self-healing is just... I heal for 50% of my health. Don't fuck with me. That only works if he's below 40% health, though. So he needs to be in a bit of a risky position to be able to use it. But it's good for getting himself out of a risky position. Which is a really good thing. And if you just buff his health more and more, it just makes it even more and more effective. 
He can then also cast, use Suffer, which decreases his stress gain by 40%, which is an awful lot, and give himself more death blow resist, taking him up to basically the maximum. He also has standardly above average death blow resist, which is pretty good. So, defensive capability. Average health at best, below average at, at without trinkets. Technically average dodge. Not really any defensive abilities apart from the self heal. So, defensive capabilities is probably, again, a B. Wrong letter. B. Just because of the self-heal. He's got nothing else going for him, really, in terms of healing. What about his healing capability? We actually have to look at his healing capability because of the simple fact he has two abilities. He's got three abilities. Or even four abilities, technically, that allow him to heal his allies. First up, Redeem. Redeem is a regeneration which also bleeds himself. That is, re we've already spoken about regen. Regen's good because it prevents, because it prevents death blow from dots, but it's bad because it's not an upfront heal, so it can't just instantly remove the risk of death blow. And also it isn't amplified by healing, by healing skills up. So for example, if I had, where's the head? If I had this head equipped for plus 30% healing skills, the regeneration effect wouldn't be affected by it. Okay? Okay. What it also means is that his debuff from his heal of minus 25% healing skills is... doesn't affect his redeem either. So, redeem. 12 HP in exchange for dealing 15 to himself. Potential. It has potential. Redeem. Heal your ally for basically 50% of their health. But again, you have to be below 40% health. But this is viable because of the fact you're bleeding yourself to try and help yourself get to that percentage health. So, again, potential. The limit is that it can only be used two times per combat, which I think they added, because it was a bit of a joke, how, how the, the self-healing of the flagellant. So, it's a really big heal, it's a really solid big heal, but limited and conditional. Stress healing, 14 stress healing, deal 6 stress to yourself. Really? That's just solid. I've got nothing else to say about that. That's just a solid stress heal. It causes him to take stress, but if you've got another stress healer to help with that, it's just solid. Suffer. Clear mark target on the ally. That's good, because you can sometimes get someone marked that you really don't want marked. Transfer bleed and blight, meaning the flagellant takes it instead of the ally meaning the ally is no longer at risk of the bleeding and blighting of killing them. And then buff himself for plus death blow resist. Well, the buffing doesn't really apply to the healing. So, his healing capability. He can't be a primary healer. He can't be a primary healer. Let us all acknowledge he is not a primary healer. But he can be an off healer. Which means he heals alongside doing other things. So for healing, I think he's a B. I think he's a B. He's got some really powerful heals, but they're conditional. He's got a really good regeneration, which hurts himself. He's got good stress healing, which hurts himself. He is not a primary healer, but if he has another healer to help him, he has potential. Utility. 
What is his utility? He reduces the bleed resist of our enemies. He can buff himself a tiny bit. He can mark himself and tank in the form of being the one that they target. And that's it. That's it. There we go. There we go. Flexibility! <gasps> Again. Again! It's, a ca it's the same case as the Paladin. He has the same case as the Paladin for flexibility. He is a frontline character, so for his damage abilities, he can only be in position 1 and 2. But for his healing, he can be in any position. Position 1, 2, 3, or 4. 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 So, theoretically, his flexibility is good. But he has no way to reposition himself. He, can, he can't push himself forward like the Paladin can. So, honestly... I think for flexibility, it is once again a B. Because he has capability to be in posi other positions, but generally you want him in the foot position 1 and 2 because you're going to be using him as a damage dealer because no one in their right mind is going to be using him as a off healer. Try the rescuer. He can reset and use... He can reset the uses per battle for everyone. So all around B. Yeah, all around B. The Flagellant is a B-tier character. My god, every standard base class has been a B-tier, has basically been a B-tier character at this point. Okay. Who is next? The Sisters. Okay. Okay, Sisters. Here's the thing. I like the sisters. But when you properly analyse and look at them, they're certainly got weaknesses. They got some major weaknesses. So let's talk about them. First up, they're a transform character. Just like just like the Fury. Just like the Lamaya, just like the Abomination, except with the fact the sisters have to transform. They have to transform. They don't get the choice. The sisters are an extremely complicated character, which I don't recommend if you're a relatively new player. So, let's talk about why. Alright? Okay. First, the offense capability. 7 to, 7 to 13. That's not good. That's not good. The sisters are in the bottom half of the damage. Of the damage side scale. They're sort of an all-round character. They are. We'll get to that. They're damp, but... They do have ways to augment their damage and do different types of damage. So, their, their average damage, I believe, is 10 ish. 10.5, 10, 10, whatever. So, if we look at their abilities, first up, possession. Possession de stresses them and stresses everyone else. Part of the reason why I don't recommend them for new players. So let's look at her Scholar abilities. Scholar ability. Weed out. Bypass stealth. De-stealth. Plus accuracy if they're bleeding. Which frankly is not needed because of the fact it's 115 accuracy already. It doesn't deal damage. But it marks them and blights them for, four, for, six, for 6 points of damage for 4 rounds. Let us compare that to the, the Flagellant which is 6 damage for 3 rounds. It's basically the flagellant's ability 
without being able to do deal damage, and with more utility, and is innately better because it's Blight. Because we've already established Blight is better. They then have a heal, which we're talking about damage, so screw moving on. They have a repost, which means they hit back if they're hit. <coughs> the ability has negative 75% damage if they're in scholar mode. But it's got 100% damage if they're in... If they're in, what am I call it? Warrior mode. Meaning there is the capability of making a repost build out of the sisters, which is really good because it's one of the only reposts which doesn't have a damage negative. But frankly, because of their low damage in the first place, they don't need a damage negative. Granted, it is armor piercing, just like the... Just like the shield breaker is. But it doesn't deal anywhere near the damage of the shield breaker. Okay. So we got that established. Now we move on to the warrior abilities, which are the ones which actually do the fighting. Trespass. Moves her for moves her for her forward to two spaces. 110 accuracy, which is above a, above average accuracy for melee attacks. 3% three, 3 crit, which is pretty poor, actually, but there's a reason for that. It's armor piercing, which is just nice, so bye-bye protections. Bypass guard, which means bye-bye, little bone noble, and your little bloody screw-off guard that we all hate because it's got too much protections in the first place. And always crit versus marked. Now, a crit is double damage. So, instead of 7 to 13 damage, it does about 14 to 26. Theoretically. That's good damage. That's actually really solid damage. But it is conditional. Because they need to be marked. What about the next ability? It's a defensive ability. Moving on. Next ability. Crimson Dance. 110 accuracy, like before. Minus 25% damage mod. Eh, they kind of don't need that. Armor piercing. Fair. And bleed for 110... 140% chance, which is standard. For 5 points for 3 rounds. So 15 damage in total. It also causes the enemy to shuffle, which is fair, and deals 75% extra damage if they're blighted. Okay, we've already established that the, the, that the sisters can blight their enemies. Okay, then what do you do? Well, so that's their last ability. So what is their damage? They can blight their enemy... For six points. They can make themselves them enemy bleed for five points. Deal a bonus damage if they're blighted. Auto crit if they're marked, which they cause via their blight ability. And call and repost, which has negative damage unless they're in their warrior mode. Could be a B. Their damage is very B. It is very B. There is a lot of damage potential. The problem is, it's a lot of playing around with the forms and maxing out everything. <coughs> so, what about their defenses? The sisters have a lot more defenses than I thought they did. So let us start with them. 43 HP. That is the average. There's, it's not like the average. It's almost the average. It is the average. 43 HP is the average. They're bang on. 28 dodge. That is a good amount of dodge. It's above average. Barely. But it's still above average. Okay. What about defensive abilities? 
they have Blossom, technically, because they can use it on themselves, which is a Restoration, which is nice, and a Stress Heal, together, which is a very nice ability. But it's a healing ability, so we're not applying it to, to protections. So, Bramble, they're a Repost ability. It applies a 40% protection mod to them. That's a big number. 40% is a big number. I didn't realize I had that until I used it the other week. But that is a big number and can actually make them able to take a hit, which is quite nice. The next defensive ability, Shroud, which causes them to move straight to the back and uh, heal themselves for 2 HP for 5 rounds. That is a very long restoration. A long restoration is a very nice restoration. It also clears marked target on themselves, which means they're less likely be to be attacked if there's another person that is marked. You wouldn't believe it with half the time they ignore mark, but it happens like that. In addition, they become stealthed, which means that the enemy can't attack them. Because I really don't think that any that there are really any enemies which can attack stealth, because stealth is normally an enemy unique ability. So, yeah, that's pretty powerful. They're stealth for two rounds, ba for two actions, basically. Because rounds, hap cause rounds uh, end at the end of your turn. And then, that's it. So they got two defensive abilities, one in each form. What about their, what about the resistances? Average death blow, average disease, average average blight, average stun, average average move, average blight, bleed, above average debuff. They really average in all of their defenses. They got some good defensive abilities, and they're but they're pretty much average in all of their stats. So again, it's looking like this is another B class. My god, I'm getting fed up with the bees everywhere. Why is everything a bee? So like a C. You say a C, but it's the fact 40% is a really good number for protections. And so is stealthing yourself. So, their stats are average, but they got really powerful defensive abilities. And since when does that have uses per battle? What about their healing? They got one healing ability. Just one. They got one healing ability, which is Blossom. Which is a restoration heal for 12 he health and minus 12 stress. It's a heal and a stress heal at the same time. Which can also be augmented with Eternal Blossom... Giving it plus 30%, giving it an extra round, meaning it becomes a 16 heal instead of 12. The Soul Pact uh, from the Crimson Court Trinkets, which means it's now stress heals for 16 instead of 12. The Haunting Scroll, which is stress healing as well. Uh. You don't help with any of that. You don't help. You don't help. You don't... Okay, so... <coughs> so their healing ability is a really good healing ability, but they only have one. They can only use it in one form, and it is single target, meaning it's limited. And it's also a restoration, not a solid heal. There's advantages to restoration and solid heals, but generally, solid heals are better. Generally. So for healing, I give the grow the I give the sisters a C. What about utility? Well So either a D or a C. It's certainly not a D, because it's a very powerful stress heal on par with the Jester. A lot. It's a basically the Jester's stress heal with a with a heal on top. So that is certainly not a D. 
And plus, the trinkets really ca She has a lot of trinkets to augment it. So, yeah. What about utility? Utility. Um... She's got a lot of ways to benefit herself from her other abilities. But the only way that she helps her allies is via Spectral, spectral Watch Guard. Which is preventing ambush. Heck, her blackened psyche hinders the ally, your allies because it gives them plus 15% stress, after all. So, the sisters have no utility. They have none, really. They're grade F. They're grade F utility. Which is fair. Everything needs a weakness and a position. And we've already established the sisters are good at both healing, def healing and offense. So, what about flexibility? The, he the, the sisters are a, a class which is interesting about their flexibility, okay? First up, every ability can... J most of their abilities can be used in every position. Position, the ability to allow them to transform themselves, every position, for obvious reasons. Weed out, every position, so you can mark them from any position. Bramble. Any position, so you can repost and get your debuff from any position. Trespass. Any position. So you can get your solid attack in any position. What about the the, sh the Shroud? Shroud is the first three positions, but it sends you to the last position, so it makes sense it doesn't work in the last position. So that's basically usable anywhere as well. Crimson Dance. Crimson Dance is the awkward one. Because it can only be used in position 2 and 4. And then it moves you forward one as well. So, that one's a little... It's easy to work with if you then... If you use Shroud. And then you use Crimson Dance. But... That's the best way you'll be able to get it. And then Blossom. Which is their healing ability. Can only be used in position 2 and 3. Which means that if you get, if they get out of those positions, you've basically completely removed their healing capability. Which is a little iffy at times. So, flexibility. No, they are always capable of moving themselves. They are always able to do something in any position that they are. But it can be a little, or it can take a turn or two. To make sure they get into the right position to be able to do certain abilities. So I'm giving them a grade of A for flexibility. Huh. So. What is the overall grade of the sisters? Frankly, I have to say it's a, probably about... Probably a B. Again. Because B seems to be the average of everything. They're... They're really good... Off damage. They're really good off healers. If you want a character to supplement the damage. And to supplement the healer at the same time. The sisters are a really good character. But you need to be aware of their weakness. That you have to transform them. Otherwise, they're just going to stress out to all hell and back. Because of their innate ability, that every ability they do stresses themselves. But, it, but every ability they do also reduces the stress of the other form. So, yeah. Be aware of these things. Do 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 do. Okay. Oh. Oh. 
Wow, we've got ages to go until guts. And it's already five o'clock. Wow, we've hardly done anyone. How many have we done? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We've done nine characters in three hours, dear Christ. I'm really go I might be going too in depth with all these characters. This is gonna need another stream, isn't it? <laughs> okay. So, the Falconeer. How do we to rate the Falconeer? Well, let's take a brief look at them. They are an archer, which is an injury, which is logically they're the la the back position, of for obvious reasons. So let's take a look at their offensive capability. Seven to thirteen damage. For the average ranged character, for if we compare them to like the Arbalist and such. They are technically mildly below damage for the Arbalist compared to the Arbalist and the Musketeer, which is 7 to 14. Okay? Their ability. 13 crit and 60% mark versus marked. These ones are 9 crit and 100% damage versus marked and 13% crit versus marked. Hmm. <coughs> So they're already kind of failing in damage compared to their co counterpart, the Arbalist and the Musketeer. What are this ability? I Thief and Ravage. I, th I Thief is a, is a mark and Ravage is a bleed. It's not much of a bleed, but it does additional damage if they're marked. Now a key thing to note about the about the falconeer is that every ability is two abilities because they have adapt which means that their abilities set to the other type of abilities. However, this does mean they only ever have technically three these three abilities to choose three of these six abilities to choose from because logically you always need adapt equipped just in case. Or if you want to utilize the full flexibility of them. So, what are these abilities? So, I Thief, it's a, ble it's a mark that does damage. That's nice. It's a mark that does damage. Or, it's a bleed. Below average bleed, because it lasts less time, but it has mark synergy, which increases its potential. Flex that scourge. It forces them forward, does additional damage while while the falconeer is stress is is stealthed, and has armor piercing if they're marked with their first skill, and does sixty percent additional damage if they're bleeding with their second skill. So if we work on the basis they're bleeding, that has basically the same damage as the as their standard attack. Next they have Volley Fire, which is the, which is attack the back three for negative 45% damage. That is, that is certainly above dav average for, for damage in terms of comparability, but they don't have the most damage to begin with to be able to be able to all take full effe effect of that. Hmm. They ought, their second ability is a debuff, which does less damage, though. Next is Spirited Cry, which cures cures stun of all allied heroes and gives them additional gives them additional crit chance and minus stress. That's all very nice. Their second ability is that it stealths them instead, and they have additional crit while stealthed. Very nice. So they have the ability to stealth themselves to get away. Next is Fleeting Escape, which sends them back two positions. It has 115 accuracy, which is standard, minus 66% damage mod, which considering its ability is to basically send you back into archery position, is very nice, because it's just not good. And... 
<coughs> mm. The first effect is that it stealths them and clears marked, and then the second ability effect is that it does more damage instead and knocks back the enemies. But that knockback has reduced chance to succeed because it's 130 instead of 140. And then their final ability of adapt to change the abilities around. Okay. So. There's clearly the obvious. Their damage definitely seems below, below the musketeer and the arbalist. Despite filling the same role. Doesn't it? I can't remember what damage I gave those two. But considering they've got reduced damage in the first place. Reduced not less synergy with marked characters, with marking, compared to those two. Better ability to mark, but that's utility, not damage. Gouge has a lot of potential, technically, but that involves turning them into a melee character. Which, if you combine... Now, as... Uh, uh. So it's looking like they're maybe a C grade for damage. So let's look at their trinkets. Bonus damage while stealthed. Okay. Bonus crit. Okay. Uh. Minus damage received. Interesting. Bonus damage versus bleeding. Bonus crit. Increased skill chances with bleed, move, and debuff. At by 30%, which would take it to most of them to 170, which is quite significant. And the trinket set says plus 25% damage if in position 2. Which by that logic means if you're using gouge or flank or whichever ability of it you're using. So, that's kind of interesting that their Crimson Court set favours basically the melee build of the Falconeer. But, let's also take a look at the trinkets which are involved with the Falconeer, the Mother, the Talon trinkets. Because, the Talon trinkets are part of the Falconeer class, so, to associate them with the Falconer doesn't seem that too far of a stretch. So what do we have? Mother's Arrow, bonus damage versus bleeding, on, on monster kill, heal 10% health. Nice. Bonus, da bonus speed plus dodge. That's a lot of dodge. That is a lot of dodge. And then you have bonus damage and accuracy for targets below 25, 20%, 50% HP. So basically, you can kill the, you can kill those near death even easier. Nice. Okay. What other ones are there? There is. Where are they? Where are they? Where are they? The Butchered Bird, plus 15% damage, 6% crit, and 20% stress. It's a big stress negative, but that crit bonus, along with the damage bonus, is a very nice thing. Alright? That's a big, that's a very good trinket for damage. You just need to be able to manage the stress all associated with it. Carrying Claw, plus crit, minus health, on attack, clear or enemy corpses. That's utility and and damage because crit. What is your base crit? 11. The Falconeer is a crit character. Their base chance to crit is 24% chance. Because their arrow has 5, 6, 13 and their base chance is, is, is 11. They are a crit character. If we take a look at the other trinkets that come with the birds, we have Feather Net, more debuffing, Harrying Boots, more debuffing, Sentry Kite, defensive, defenses with the protection, and utility with the scouting, and then Shrike's Mask, which is bleeding. A lot of bleeding. An awful lot of bleeding. So let's take a look at the Musketeer's crit. Base crit, 10%. Crit mod, 
9%. If they're marked, 13%. That takes it to 32%. So that means even with the 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 ranged character, the Falconeer being a crit character, they still have less crit and less damage and in every way than the Falconeer, the Musketeer, and the Arbalist. But they are still a damage character and aren't the worst at it. So the damage is a C. What about their defensive capabilities? <laughs> They have surprisingly high defensive capabilities, actually. If we compare them to the Arbalest and such like again, which is, I'm going to keep doing because that's what they're based... That's They fill the same role. 20 dodge for the Arbalest, 47 HP. 23, 43 HP and 25 dodge. So more dodge, but a little less HP. Frankly, the more dodge... Probably makes up for that little less HP, on average. Compared to most other characters. What about their resistances? Above average disease. Average blight. Average 90% blight, 90% stun. 85% 85 move, which is technically below average, but probably near enough for it to be fine. 90% bleed. And 90% debuff. The resistances are entirely average. There's nothing to be said about that. But they have... They, what do they have for defensive abilities, though? Stealth. They have two different ways to give themselves stealth. And while stealth itself is not a... Defensive capability... Is not innately defensive, it is definitely used for defenses. Don't worry, Michael. I think this might be the last review because my voice is dying. <laughs> I think 10 characters is good for now. We still have another 48 to go. Uh. No, wait, that's not including the six I did. We have another 42 to go after this. Uh So. So. Huh. Defensive capabilities. Defense quite good for defense. I'm just going to have a quick check at what rank I gave the... At what rank I gave the Arbalist and whatnot. Because I think they should be a higher rank than the Arbalist and the Musketeer. Oh boy, strap in PFA. It's going to be a long ride. Yeah, tell me about it. So, because I gave the Arbalist and the Musketeer a rank D for defense, I think I'm going to give the, the Falconeer a, a rank C for, for defense. They are more defensive than the Arbalist and the the Musketeer in a different way. I think there is still some that aren't even on your roster. There are. There are. But I have included them in the list. Such as, here we have the Trap Maker. There are some in my list which I have to look at by scrolling through this too much. Because... We've had a couple of deaths, such as, where are they? We've got the Ironclad, the Occultist, the Royal Aegis. There are a number that aren't in my list because they I've had them and they've died or whatever. Okay, so now we work on healing. First up, does the Falconeer have healing? Yes. Just like the Arbalest, they have stress healing. Well, they have a tiny heal. They have a tiny stress heal, which is three stress for the entire party, instead of a single target, and a, and a stun clear for all heroes. Stun clear for all heroes is pretty good. <coughs> so, but it's still... 
their only ability, and they don't have much of it. So for healing, I'm going to give them a grade E. That's the wrong letter. That's the wrong letter. That's the right letter. Because again, I think I gave the Arbalist and other one a rank it's F for healing, which frankly the Falconeer should be, but the ability to clear stun has its uses. What's that? The healing is a C or a D, or the defensive capabilities is a C or a D. Okay, so, next we'll move on to utility. What is the utility of the Falconeer? Well, considering I said we're taking into effect of the trinkets for the Falconeer, because it comes with the mods, we have, that's a utility trinket, that's a utility trinket, and that's a utility trinket. So that's three trinkets... Which is already utility. It's definitely not a C or a D for healing. It does not do anywhere near enough. So we got three trinkets. Which give utility for the Falconeer. Good morning no Mortimer Nova. My day is going fine. Glad to see you in the Twitch chat. We're reviewing classes at the moment. And, this is and we're currently on the Falconeer. There's a lot of classes to go through, and I'm losing my voice already. Huh. So. Utility. What utility comes under debuffing and such like? So, what debuffs and buffs and such does the Falconeer have? First, her, s her base attack is a debuff. And a buff. Her base attack has the ability to buff herself for 3 speed. If it's in its second form, it has the ability to debuff the enemy for minus 15 dodge and minus 3 speed. The minus 3 speed isn't that big, but minus 15 dodge is, assuming the enemy has dodge, which most do. It's And because it's your standard attack, you're not losing anything from it either. Okay. Their mark. Their mark is... A damage mark, which alone is pretty good. It also comes with a debuff, which is minus accuracy, which makes it even nicer as well. Gouge also comes with the debuff of negative accuracy. Flurry has the ability to... has You can change it to become a debuff for negative accuracy. Spirited Cry... Buff all heroes for 7% crit. Harrying escape. Debuff the enemies it hits for negative, da for negative accuracy. And potentially knock them back, depending on which mode you're in. Every ability that the Falconeer has, has some form of utility. Every single ability. So, because of the sheer utility behind her, and the fact you can choose your utility at times, I honestly have to give... I think I have to give the the Falconeer an S for utility. Just because every ability has some aspect of utility. Every single ability can do something. She isn't the most damaging. But... If you can bind her, especially with her Crimson Court Trinket, which is this one, for plus 30% debuff chance, that is negative, that is 170% chance to debuff the enemy. And the thing is, that logically would also apply to the trinkets. So, if I now hit the enemy with these trinkets, if I hit the enemy... I have a 170% chance, technically, to debuff the enemy for 20 dodge and 5 speed. So, yeah. That is an awful lot of utility that the, the 
Falcon Ear has. What about flexibility? Okay. The mark works in every position. That's fair. Crippling sh the ranged attack works in the f back three. In the back two. That's average. We expect that. Volley fire. Back two. Spirited cry. Back two again. Adapt. Any position, as you'd expect. Gorge slash flank. It works in the first three and moves her forward. The moving her forward is a bit iffy, but it really depends on your build with her. And then, Harrying Escape, which is the first two and moves her back three posi two positions, meaning she can easily get back to position three and four to be able to use the majority of her abilities. So, what is she for flexibility? Most of her abilities can, e can only be used in the back two, but they can easily, she can easily get back to them if she has the ability equipped. So, here's the, the great question is, what do we rank her? And frankly, I think she is at least a, probably an, probably an A, a you think she is a B? A B for flexibility? Yeah, I suppose. She's limited to in her positioning for abilities, but she can easily get back to them. So, the question is, what grade is the poor little falconeer? The question I see it as, is she grade C or is she grade B? Her damage is pretty... Poor, but has potential. Her defensive capability is average, but with a few unique twists. Her healing, we don't even consider. It's not a part of her, really. Her utility is, in, is extremely powerful. And her ability to get back to her own position is definitely a strong suit. So it's hard to... Get her out of position that for that long. So, honestly, I think I'm going to rate her the same rank as I gave the Arbalist and the Musketeer. In other words, a rank C. She's probably B overall, simply because of the trinkets that come alongside her. She has a lot of things... That come alongside her. So it's rather the class itself is probably... The class itself is a B. Let's just bring her back up. The class itself is a C. But the mod is a B. If that makes sense. Class is a C. Mod is a B. That's how I feel, at least. So let's now move on to the Jester. Maybe. <clears throat> mm. Let's see, how many characters have we done? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven... Eight, nine, ten. God Christing damn it. Okay. So I think Can your throat still hang on? That is the question. The problem with my throat right now is that I don't actually feel any achiness behind the throat. It's just getting a little bit harder and harder to talk. It's more like I'm losing my voice rather than it is my voice is actually hurting. Which is a very weird sensation, to say the least. So Viper, we'll do one more review. Pick a class. Pick a class. We'll review one final class in my list.
I think I can do one more. Just to make it a nice 11. How about the Wrath? Which one? We've got this Wrath. We've got... Da -da -da -da, this Wrath. And then we have... Where is he? The Dark Wrath. Or Wraith. We got the Wraith, the Wraith, and the Dark Wraith. Which Wraith? Grim Wraith? Bounty Hunter Wraith? Or Dark Wraith? What are the trinkets for the characters I've reviewed so far, by the way? The one with the skull mask that's next to the jester. Okay. Okay. Ah! The Grim Wraith. The Grim Wraith. Let's see about the Grim Wraith. Okay. Well, the Grim Wraith is a crit character. He He's a crit character. His damage is... He's actually a crit character and a dot character, funny enough. Which is... And also has got a lot of really weird quirks about him. So, his base damage, 11 to... 8 to 11. That is... Pretty poor, honestly. Average, 9.5. So, definitely way below average for damage. Stats. 30 HP. The average is 43. He is very sh low in health. In fact, what rank is he in he health? One. He has the fifth lowest health in the game. Does the grit? Does this? Does the grim wraith? And only and has 25 dodge as well, which is technically the average, which is okay. Which is okay. 12% crit. Now, what is 12% crit? 12% crit is the second highest crit level. The, o the only one higher is the Snake Charmer. Which I can't be bo Which is this guy. 13%. Compared to 12 so, let's look at his abilities. Phantom Strike. Usable in every position. 115% accuracy. Melee attack. Gives a buffs himself, depending on which position he is in. If he's in position 1, he gets plus 8 dodge. Position 2, plus 8 accuracy, which he doesn't need. Position 3, plus 6% crit. Position 4. Plus 15% damage. And then he increases the RE and SH values of his certain skills. And the RE basically means an increase for bleeding and blight... Increasing his bleeding and blighting potential. So, and when he uses this ability, he gets negative 2% damage received. Every time. And it lasts something like 90 rounds. Reaping Evisceration. Moves himself forward. Can only attack the first two rows. Bypasses Guard, which is nice. Damage Mod, which is nice. Of 10%. 120 Accuracy, so above average. For a ranged character when he's melee. 160% chance to bleed. For one point of damage for one round. And debuff the target for 35% damage received at 160% chance. Buff self for plus 2% damage, which is also pretty damn good. And, pre and prevents marking himself. Sinister Fury. 
98 accuracy. Pretty low. 75% damage reduction mod. Okay. Plus 35% damage versus bleeding. Got it. Plus fit... Pl activates repost. Okay, that works. Plus 50% damage when repost. That's pretty good. Plus 50% damage from using this ability again. Also pretty damn good. Damage reflection. Okay. And increases the skill and increases how much he bleeds people for. Which in this case is 400%. So I believe that means that takes the the 1 damage and makes it into 4 damage for 1 round. Okay. Next we move on to Devious Ambush. Which pushes him forward 3 positions. Can only be used in the back 2. 110 accuracy. Okay. Bypass guard, that's pretty good. Knock back the enemy, interesting. 0% chance to stun. I'm pretty sure that's got, it's augmented somehow. Bonus damage versus stunned. Bonus damage versus blight. Mm. And bonus, and increase the chance to skip, to bleed people. And buff self for 1% crit. Soul harvest, used in every position. Can only attack the back two. Moves himself back two positions. 20% damage mod. That's a lot. Bypass stealth. Deplete the initiative of the tar- Depletes the target's initiative. Which basically means they don't get their turn. If they have it- If they haven't had it already. Blight them. For one round- For one point for three rounds. At 160% chance. Mark self- Plus 2% max health. Prevent marking self. Ugh. Scattering Dread. Usable in the last two. 105 accuracy. Minus damage mod. It de bypasses stealth. And de-stealths the enemy. It attacks the, it attacks the position of 2 and 3 together. It causes them to shuffle for 4 rounds. Which means they're going to be flying all over the place. Debuffs them for minus 15 accuracy. Buff self for 6 for six speed. Buff how much you blight for. How much blight damage they de he deals with soul harvest. And gives himself more accuracy. And then Grimshade. Buffs himself for... S stealths himself for 2 rounds. Moves him back three 3 positions. Plus 80% damage, plus 10% plus 10 crit, plus 40% armor piercing, plus 160% chance to, skip, to, to, to stun, increase his, dodge, increase his blight damage again, and gives him one dodge. <coughs> okay. So... Let's talk about his offensive capability, because that's what this character is. Completely offense. But, it's all about combining a lot of abilities in order to empower Soul Harvest or Reaping Evisceration. That's what it is. You combine these abilities to... What am I call it? Com you combine these abilities to power these two. He's got a 160% chance to bleed or blight, which is basically extremely powerful. It is a very powerful bleed and blight, that. But it does so little damage unless you use abilities previously. And these abilities all buff himself, but that's not important for the damage. So... What is his damage? It is extremely hard to tell what his damage is. His base damage is pretty poor. So, Phantom Strike with 15% damage mod would only be basically how much it says right here. 9 to 13. Possibly 9 to 14. Which is... Technically above average uh, compared to the musketeer and the thing, because 
Musketeer and Arbalest because they're 7 to 14. So possibly a bit better than them, but not really that much better. He... Uh, every one of his abilities is used to basically empower these two abilities to empower the Blight and... Could be a B. I'm going to give it a B. Just because I don't know how else to rank it. Because there is tons of potential. But there's tons of ways to fuck up as well. To make it absolutely terrible. What about defense? His health is garbage. His dodge is average. His resistances are 90, 90, 90, 90, 90. Completely average. Completely average. Apart from disease, which is six, which is not 70% for some stupid reason. Who knows? So... Uh, his defensive capabilities what defensive abilities does he have this reduces his damage by 2% which when built up enough is significant this is that uh, crit this gives him additional health which once built up enough is quite significant this gives him more dodge which, when built up enough, is quite significant. So, for defenses, I think also this ability stealths him for the next attack. Which is very nice, because stealth is just one of those really good abilities. So for defense, I was thinking a C as well. The problem with the... Rating the Wraith is also he doesn't have healing, so m throw that out the window. Is that it's all about the longer the dungeon goes on, the more powerful he becomes. Because he's attacked more, he's gained more buffs from him from from himself from like a negative two percent damage reduction every turn for five rounds across six. Combats would be about 66% damage reduction ish. Actually, I forgot. What trinkets do you have, Mr. Wraith? What trinkets do you have? Plus damage, plus health. Plus dodge, plus, plus, dodge, plus crit, minus health. I do have the other ability to that, so hold on. Uh, plus... Oh, now I understand what R... How has it taken me this long to realize what RE and SH means? It means... It means reaping evisceration and soul harvest. What the hell is wrong with me? Plus 50% damage for, R for reaping harvest and soul harvest, meaning that would become a 70% damage mod, and that would become a 60%. But basically neuters its ability to actually to debuff to debuff blight and bleed. You got these two, which is bonus damage for Sinister Fury, more dodge, and more damage for reaping evisceration, and the and it's got twenty percent armor piercing, which is okay. These two, which is Blight Resist, minus damage received, plus HP, minus dodge. Phantom Strike, plus damage, plus crit, minus dodge. Uh, plus debuff skill chance. Scattering Dread, which one was that? That one, okay. So... Okay, what's his utility? That debuffs the target for plus 35% damage received. 
That's pretty damn good. Especially as it's a 160% chance to succeed. That is a repost, which technically comes under offense, but also utility more than... Yeah, this is utility. more And a bit of utility. That's a stun, but needs to be comboed with that. And is a 160% chance. But that's a 160% chance to stun, which is the most powerful stun I've seen so far. And it's a knockback. That depletes the target's initiative, meaning it denies them their turn. That's extremely powerful. That's d minus accuracy on the target. For utility, it would be B. Yeah, I can th agree with a B. Again, he's got a lot of build-up for his abilities. What about flexibility? That works in every position. That works in every position. That works in the first two. That works in the last two. That works in every position. That works in the last two. And that works in every position and sends him straight to the back. Can we disagree with that? Can we honestly disagree with that? His primary attack works in every position. Th his, his special attacks work in every position. His defensive ability, technically, works in every position. And then he's got two abilities that work in the back to back two, and one that works in the back in the first two. Nada. You don't agree with an S rank for his flexibility? You don't agree with S rank for flexibility with this character? Because I think, I really think he work. He can be in any position. He can only be a heal. He can only be a damage dealer, though. So that kind of hinders his flexibility for his role. But it's a case of he can be different types of di of damage dealer. He can be the melee damage dealer. He can be the the off damage dealer with utility attached. He can be the primary range damage dealer. So, what about an overall grade? I... He does also have the mechanism of souls attached to him. So he can... When he's in the party, he gets souls. You can find souls off the enemy, which you can drink to gain stress and buffs. So... Hmm... Hmm. Wait, hold on. Reaper's stratagem. Self only. A hundred and plus a hundred and fifty percent chance to sk to to stun with devious ambush. When that gives him a plus a hundred, that would give him three hundred and ten percent chance to stun. What the fuck? 310% chance to stun. I think you could stun almost things that can't be stunned with that. But yeah, I agree. A grade B seems pretty accurate for the Wraith. I'm getting fed up of giving everything a grade B, I will be honest. It kind of makes me think that I need to lower the grade of everything by one. Just so that everything that was grade B needs to become a grade C. Because C is meant to be the average. But, no matter. We've got our grading system for... the. We've, got, we've now graded the Grim Wraith. So. The question is, why haven't I seen you use him before? I have used him before, but I don't use him very often.
is the thing. I can't remember the last time I've used it. I used him, but I have definitely used him. Or why haven't you seen him use him more? Oh, because Squish. I don't. I'm not the biggest fan of squishy characters. And 30 HP is Squish. It's the fifth lowest out of all of the characters. Well, everyone, my voice is dying at long last. So I'm afraid that despite having another 40 odd, 48 ish characters to go, it looks like I have to end the stream here, which is a shame. So, everyone, it looks like what can I say other than thank you all for joining me today? Be sure to join me again next time when we next do another Darkest Dungeon class review stream. Because I'm sure we're going to have to have more. So everyone, I'm afraid that until then, it is time for me to bid the all farewell, good day, and finally, good night.